Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, to the highlights of Energy Research 2021. Energy storage, a key element to energy transition. Uh, I'd like to welcome all participants from Austria and from the IEA Energy Storage TCP. Uh, my name is Sabine Mitter. I'm responsible for the IEA Energy Technology Network in the Ministry of Climate Action. And I have the pleasure to guide you to, to this uh, first opening session. And I will also facilitate the panel discussion in the afternoon. Uh, you might know we have planned this event as a hybrid event, uh, but due to the pandemic situation and the lockdown in Austria, we had to uh, switch to fully online. Um, we have set up uh, a studio here in the beautiful TU the Sky. Uh, we have chosen this location, I have to say, because uh, it's a very innovative building and uh, was renovated to a plus energy standard some years ago. So I hope the next time you will have the chance to visit here. Um, and yeah, as I said, we have uh, set up a studio here and we will transmit uh, the moderation from here. So I'm here with uh, the organ organizing team uh, and the speakers, the panelists and all the participants take part online. And uh, you will have the possibility uh, to follow um, the chat and to comment and ask questions uh, in the live chat. Uh, but to start with, uh, I would like to uh, do two short uh, slide polls uh, to get to know a little bit better the audience. So um, if you are in front of the computer, please check the right side of the um, of the live stream, you can see the poll there. Uh, the first question refers to the region you come from. So please answer if you come of one of the Austrian provinces or if you come from uh, another country. Then you click international, please. Okay. Yeah, still some people participating. Yeah, here we have the um, results. Most people are coming from Vienna, but also from uh, Upper Austria, Lower Austria, and also about 16% uh, from international. These are our colleagues from the Energy Storage TCP, uh, but also from Styria, Carinthia, Salzburg, we have uh, participants. So let's go to the next question. Here I would like to uh, know a little bit your institutional background. So uh, are you from a research institute, a public administration, a company, uh, a representation of interest or other? Yes. Yeah, we see most of our guests are from uh, research institutes, followed by companies, but also from the public sector and uh, NGO or other, <coughs> other institutions. Uh, thank you very much for that overview. It's, uh, yeah, very interesting. So, but before I hand over uh, to Henriette, I'd just like to um, show you uh, the day, um, 
what you can expect. So in the morning, um, we have now the opening, followed by the first session, uh, um, which gives an overview on the energy storage TCP and also on the energy storage situation in Austria. Then we have uh, planned for coffee break. At 11.50, we are follow with the session two on battery storage and large scale solar heat. Uh, at 12.15, lunch break. We continue at uh, 1.15, Uh, with uh, session three on Carnot batteries and sector coupling. And we, uh, we will end with a panel discussion that starts at 2.15 and um, the whole event should conclude at uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. I'd also like to inform you that uh, we have all the presentation slides uh, available online on our website, netnachhaltigwirtschaften.at. And uh, we have also produced a, a new brochure of the Energy Innovation Austria, especially for this event, Energy Storage Systems, Key Technology for the Energy Transition. Uh, this short brochure is available in English and German, and it covers uh, Austrian projects on this topic and also the IEA projects, and can be downloaded from the same website. But having said that, I would like to continue with the opening words. Here I would like to introduce Henriette Spira. Uh, since September 2021, she is the head of Directorate uh, Innovation and Technology in the Federal Ministry for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology, short BMK. Uh, before she was scientific head of the Federal Environmental Agency and has long-standing experience in research and innovation policy. Please, Henriette, go ahead with your words. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Sabine. And I'm, I'm indeed very sad that I cannot be at TU Sky because even though I've been working in this field for quite some time, I had never had the chance to visit this very innovative building. So I will, I'm really looking forward to the next event, which, will, which we'll be able to, to hold on top of, of this building in Vienna. Um, what's new, because we've been working on energy research for a very long time, it's time and scale. Energy transition requires a switch to an energy supply with 100% renewable energy sources, which is actually law in Austria. And of course, it poses major technical and organizational challenges to our energy system. To be able to guarantee a safe and efficient provision of electricity and heat in the future, New approaches in energy distribution and storage with greater flexibilities are needed. So far, as you know, you're the, you're the expert in this field. Pumped hydropower storage plants, biomass and fossil fuel plants have been serving as storage capacity. The increasing use of fluctuating renewables from solar and wind power and also the decentralization of the energy generation call for new storage solutions. Electrical, thermal, and chemical storage systems will be key components in a future energy system as they are able to compensate the fluctuation between generation and consumption, provide flexibility for grids, and contribute to system stability, security, and quality of supply. Innovative energy storage will play an important role for electricity and heating markets and be a central building block for something which is also very important for interconnections to the mobility buildings and industry sectors. Many of these innovative storage solutions are still in a research development or demonstration phase. So still a lot of research efforts are needed to reducing investment costs, extending service lives, increasing efficiency and improved design and safety. Of course, we also need to develop business models and legal frameworks. And this is why I alluded to time and scale at the beginning, because everything has to happen kind of at the same time and very rapidly if we want to achieve our climate and energy goals uh, in Europe and indeed all over the world. From a funding perspective, um, our ministry, the Ministry of Innovation and Climate Action, offers a variety of national research, innovation and investment funding programs for a small country like Austria. International and EU funding schemes are essential, of course, in addition to our national offerings. Austria, and Sabine has also 
uh, already mentioned this, as a very active member in the IEA technology network. Austria participates in 21 IEA technology collaboration programs, mainly in the end use and renewables sector. Researchers and companies collaborate with 49 countries worldwide in about 100 running projects. I'm very pleased that the Ministry of Climate Action is hosting this event in collaboration with the IEA TCP on energy storage and sadly uh, the biannual meeting in Vienna back to back to this event now also has to take place online and I'm really sorry for you not being able to enjoy the Viennese Christmas markets. We can't either. Um, I'm also very happy, and Sabina mentioned it, I can show you, I've got a printed version, that we could publish an Austrian energy storage market report for the first time, covering different innovative storage systems, and you will hear about it later on today. I can tell you that energy storage will play a crucial role in our new R&D program initiatives. One of these new initiatives will focus on establishing real-life labs for integrated regional energy systems. The goal of this initiative is to develop system solutions that can host 100% renewable energy in the regional supply by enhanced energy management in combination with flexibility, storage, and sector coupling. These labs will be established in prototypical Austrian regions and will test solutions with actual companies, utilities, infrastructures, communities, and their citizens in the centers, because as I already said twice, time and scale are of the essence. So we really need to test out stuff in real life. I will stop here and hand over to Therese Vogel, the Managing Director of our Climate and Energy Fund, I wish you a successful day with interesting presentations and fruitful discussions. I do have to mention one caveat. Uh, we do place a lot of importance on not having all male panels or uh, lots of uh, just male presentations. We were not very successful today. I'm happy that we can welcome some women, but not enough, I have to state. So it's also very important for us at the ministry to make sure that we have more female researchers and more female representations at forums like today. So thank you to my colleagues at the Climate Ministry, to the Climate and Energy Fund, and also to IEA colleagues for organizing today's event. And well, have fun um, and uh, drink your own coffee, um, I have to say. Thank you. Oh, it seems to be my turn now. <laughs> so good morning also from my side, Director Spira, Mr. Bockhofen, I hope I spelled it right. I, I'm not sure about that. And uh, good morning also to all the participants uh, in the studio and uh, at the screens, unfortunately. It is really a pleasure to be with you today, even though we cannot meet face to face uh, in the wonderful to the TU the Sky uh, Hall. It's, it's really a very nice place. I was there several times and you have a great overview over most of the parts of Vienna. Uh, I think it was said a lot about energy storages and their role. I mean, our today's program gives an insight to, to energy research in Austria and also to energy related activities in the market. And this time, because it's an annual event, uh, the, the highlights of the energy research, this time dealing with the energy storage at the core. And the energy storage technologies, uh, they are not only a key uh, to a sustainable energy system and to decarbonization. They are also a prospering market field, as we will see very soon. Uh, I mean, already a broad portfolio of storage solutions is available from batteries at various size and types, at least to heat storages, in my view, uh, at present an underrated field, I must say, from hydrogen-based solutions to flexible sector coupling at all, uh, all scales, also at large scale. And all of them seem to contribute to resilience and to security of supply. So the topic of uh, today's event is really high on the agenda, not only in research and in production, but also in the design of the regulatory framework, as Henry Spiro has mentioned. And it is also a 
door opener for energy communities at least we also should have that in my, keep that in mind uh, i would like to mention that a few days ago we had really an interesting national workshop on the topic of energy storages uh, exchanging our national experience and getting in touch with a lot of, of really innovative solutions on the edge of, of, let me see, a newly upcoming energy system based on renewables. And I think today we are proceeding with that discussion on a more international level also. So thanks also to the IEA and to the group uh, joining us and, and doing that uh, event together. The, uh, as I mentioned, highlights of the energy research is an annual event and we at the Austrian Climate and Energy Fund, we are we really very much appreciate to be part of this series, this time uh, as an international event. And many thanks also to all the experts which are contributing today, sharing our knowledge with us. And uh, yeah, at least now I'm looking forward. I wish you a good and, and fruitful discussion today, good presentations. And I'm really looking forward to learn more from the IA about the international perspective and to participate also in your experience. And now I think I hand over again to Sabine. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Henriette Spira and Theresia Vogel for this very kind introductory words. Um, we will now conclude the opening session with that. Uh, if you, uh, Henriette and Therese, if you would like to uh, follow uh, the whole program, you have to switch now to the, to the live stream. But now we will continue with the session one. And therefore, I would like to um, invite Elvira Lutter who will uh, guide you to this uh, first session. She is a program manager in the Climate and Energy Fund and will introduce you to the next session. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, hello, good morning uh, and welcome to the uh, Highlights for Energy Research 2021. I'm happy that I can be today here at the TU Sky uh, and not in my home office because the view here is much nicer. I don't have a rooftop apartment. Um, yes, I'm the moderator of the first session, which has uh, three presentations. And after the session, we have a so-called virtual coffee break uh, until 11.15. And uh, to all the, the viewers of these uh, highlights, please, uh, if you have any questions, post them to the chat. Uh, we will either... Uh, um, ask the questions to the, the speakers uh, immediately after the presentation. And if not, uh, the time, uh, let's say, is not enough, uh, we ask the speaker to reply directly afterwards in the chat. And yes, now it's the time for the first presentation. It's Mr. Theun Bockhofen from the Netherlands. Uh, he's the chair of the executive committee of the IE Energy Technology Network and Energy Storage. And he will give a presentation on the importance of energy storage in the uh, uh, trans, uh, uh, global in the future global energy system. And let's say, I say the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for having the opportunity to share some of our views and insights from the technology collaboration program on energy storage. Um, as uh, being said uh, earlier by Henriette and Theresia, the, um, the Austrian contribution to our programs are uh, very important. Uh, we are very happy with all the, uh, the high level of uh, contribution we see in many of our tasks from uh, the Austrian participants in our energy storage uh, TCP. Um, in this uh, brief introduction, I would like to highlight uh, shortly what the uh, IEA uh, the Technology Collaboration Program implies. So I have a sheet on that. Then I'd like to convey with you the, uh, the strategic considerations we have why energy storage is getting and gaining much more interest at this point in time. And then finally, I, I highlight some of the current activities within our TCP. Can I have the next slide, please? The IEA, of course, many of you may know the IEA from the past, where it's only considered the energy security of supply. 
But lately, the last couple of years, the focus of the IEA has been shifted to more how we can decarbonize our energy system and how can we contribute in the battle against climate change. And that changing focus also implies that there's a lot of new technology developments which are being encouraged and organized and coordinated within the IEA. That's being done within the IEA technology network. Um, within that network, there uh, at, at the moment 38 what they call technology collaboration programs (TCPs). And one of those TCPs uh, it relates to energy storage, and it's called Energy Storage TCP. Um, it's a long-lasting uh, uh, event with our uh, TCP. We are established in '79, um, and we have currently 21 countries and more than 150 participants in the various tasks we uh, we do. And I will talk about some of the tasks in the, in the part, later part of this presentation. Um, energy storage TCP, we, we need, really want to anticipate on the energy system transformation. I think uh, compared to some of the other technologies in the program, um, like solar or wind or hydrogen, um, the energy storage components are far more outreaching to, as they really contribute to the total system transformation. Um, and they relate to many of the other technologies and they have a kind of central focus point within the scope of all the technologies required to go to a new system. Um, within the scope of our energy storage TCP, we deal with thermal storages, electrical, chemical and system aspects. And of course, our main uh, uh, objective as TCP is to uh, collaborate uh, within the international forum and the institutes uh, who are dealing with energy storage to coordinate and work on specific tasks and actions. Next slide, please. The, um, the, uh, the energy situation is, uh, and the system is rapidly changing in, on the road to decarbonize the energy system. We see on the let's see production side um, a, a very steep increase in renewable energy productions in many parts of the world, uh, mainly with solar and PV, uh, solar and uh, and wind. Um, but at the same time, we have to realize that there's also a huge shift in within the demand profiles. Uh, we see in the mobility sector that petrol for cars is being replaced and diesel is being replaced by electricity and maybe for the, the heavy transport for hydrogen uh, or other options of fuels, biofuels. For the industry, we see a, a tendency to phase out fossil fuels for the heating part and they go to electrolyzing many of the processes in the industry. On the domestic level, we see, of course, production from PV at rooftops, but also there's a, 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 a tremendous shift going on from fossil fuel based heating systems to um, electrical heat pump driven heating systems. Well, all these changes on the sector side, on the demand side, combined with the various uh, renewable uh, sources, which have a variable uh, production uh, level, uh, requires that there is a, a need for a balance in between. Well, many of the electricity or of the renewable forms are based on the electricity. So electricity moves gradually to the heart of the system because also many of the load patterns and the demand sites change from fossil fuels to electrical options. And storage and flexibility are in the middle of this process in order to make this whole uh, system balanced between variable reduction, renewable production and those changing uh, demand profiles. So within that uh, perspective, value is gained to uh, energy storage. Um, in the past, um, energy storage didn't get any specific economic value in the system. What we currently see is that there's a huge change that energy storage in the system as a parameter gains also from an economical point of view. Next slide, please. So what are the challenges we have to face in the coming time? Well, basically, um, there's uh, the, the, the big challenge is to optimize the system. What I just said, how can we balance the production of renewables and these changing demand profiles? That is a, a very important aspect. Um, and of course, storage needs to be put in the middle of that process. 
um, between the production and the uh, demand side. Uh, basically, I think if we, if we really look at how, how stories can be compared, the fossil fuels in the past used to be a very condensed storage mean. Uh, so we have to look at how we can replace the aspects of storage from the fossil area era to new technologies, which will uh, deal with electricity storage and heat storage and cold storage and other options where we can shift, let's say, our energy and, and cover the time lap between the time of production and the time of use. Um, this will take also from uh, as a main challenge is to integrate these new technologies in new business models. Um, sometimes we found that in the world it is very extremely difficult to get energy storage either being part of the energy grid or being part of the production size or even part of the load patterns or the, or the consumer sites or the industry sites. So we see new business models developing in order to get the right, uh, let's say, uh, aspects of storage somewhere in the value chain. And that has, of course, a very uh, important economic parameter. And apart from those two more systematic and economic challenges, there still remains a very important uh, technology challenge, how we can optimize and advance the storage technologies in general. Next slide, please. So if we look at our research priorities from the energy storage TCP perspective, um, we see that there's, um, uh, basically two areas. One deals with the system transformation, how to put energy storage in a decarbonized energy system. Um, so bringing the time of production and the demand together, um, coupling the sectors with storage in between and maximum, uh, maximize in that way the renewable energy production. Um, the, the importance of, of storage there cannot be highlighted enough. And basically, without storage, the situation will be very dramatic in terms of how uh, production and demand could be matched. Um, apart from that, um, storage solutions need to be developed further. Uh, again, this deals with uh, electrical storage, with heating and cooling storages, and all kinds of intermediate and hybrid options. Um, it is it's very important that these kind of storages all uh, require safety. Uh, of course, we all know that uh, sometimes batteries have some safety issues that should be avoided. Um, the same goes with the thermal uh, storages. Um, the safety aspects, as the technology gets more into the highlight and into the system, need to be focused on and uh, need to be worked on. Um, affordability and the enormous important element to uh, basically be able to implement energy storage as a component in the system, it needs to be affordable uh, in order to have the uh, large scale implementation we all look for. And of course, it needs to be compact. Compactness for whether, whether um, any of these solutions is of extreme importance. Uh, if we want, for instance, address the a build environment with the thermal storages and the existing building stock, there's not too much space for huge, large amounts of cubic meters of water or whatever other storage materials. We have to make them compact. This means we have to go to other materials like and other processes like uh, TCMs, uh, thermochemical storages or PCMs or whatever um, compact ways we can look at uh, storage development. Um, and I think in the end, of course, cost effectiveness is important for the extra um, growth we want to see envision in our uh, decarbonized energy system. Next link, slide please. So just to highlight a few of our uh, current activities. Um, basically, on the system level, we have what we call tasks. And tasks are basically the collaboration programs we have within our TCP uh, on a certain subject. And more countries and institutes, uh, multiple uh, institutes work together on such a task. One of them is task 32, and it deals with modeling of energy storage. It's been observed that many of the uh, energy models we use, like transits or times model, don't take the, let's say, the parameters of energy storage in the proper way. 
And they're either very much, uh, let's say, focused on the energy production side or on the energy efficiency side, but everything in between and the way these uh, two flows can be matched is lacking. So this task works on the modeling and uh, providing input on an open source basis for these kind of models. Then we have task 35, which deals with flexible sector coupling. Um, you will have a an, an presentation of that later today, so I won't go into the details. Andreas Howard will probably inform you much more in detail on the enormous impact of sector coupling and the use and the role energy storage will have in that, uh, in that process. Um, another task deals, task 37, deals with smart design and controls of energy storage solutions. Um, basically, uh, focusing at the built environment, but then using artificial intelligence and Internet of Things in order to make sure that you have the right, uh, uh, let's say, mechanisms to anticipate on smart grids uh, and on all kinds of new, um, let's say, uh, digital uh, uh, steering mo uh, measures for um, using and utilizing the storage in that process. Of course, um, large thermal energy storage in district heatings. Uh, I think Wim van Helder will talk about it later today in one of the uh, sessions. It's very important because there's a growing uh, demand for district heating networks all over uh, Europe in particular, but also in other parts of the world. Uh, district heating is taking up very strongly and energy storage will provide the necessary flexibility uh, to make that, uh, that uh, development uh, strong. There will be two new um, tasks uh, will we consider over the next few days in our executive committee. One of these uh, relates to uh, the economics of uh, energy storage. As I mentioned earlier, it's getting very much important now to see how energy um, storage has an economic value in the system because that will, let's say, increase the deployment. And the second um, new uh, task will probably be approved around large scale, medium duration energy storage, in particular electricity. As we see that a lot of the grid problems we see now happening with the transformation to decarbonized decarbon systems relates to the fact that we have um, some large scale, medium duration storage requirements. Next sheet, please. With regard to the Technical um, task, we have um, a task that relates to what we call the comfort climate box. It's a kind of a, um, a, a strange name, but it actually deals with the integration of uh, heat pumps and energy storage into an integrated uh, uh, apparatus, integrated unit, uh, which can communicate with a smart grid and be still used also to relieve the uh, electricity grid or even the PV production locally uh, to uh, deploy such an integrated unit for the existing building stock. Uh, that's being uh, concluded somewhere later to the, uh, the, this year. Canoe batteries, of course, also is an important um, uh, task where uh, Don Bauer will tell you later on today. And we have an OSIA um, uh, initiative about ground source de-icing, uh, snow melting systems for the infrastructure, which is a very important task on um, infrastructure-related issues. Materials and components, um, the ongoing activity where we constantly keep a lot of institutes in Europe and the world are working on how we can make thermal storages more compact in order to provide the, um, the required energy storage capacity, basically in industry and in the built environment. Next sheet, please. To conclude, um, I like to call out to you and join our community, check our website for information. If possible, join our activities in our tasks. I think it's a very interesting, a very, let's say, actual um, uh, subject, energy stories. Sign up to our newsletter, and I hope we will meet you in one of our tasks over the next uh, period. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you have a very enjoyable day together. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, and now I have some questions for you. The first one is which storage technologies, according to your opinion, uh, have the greatest need for research? Um, well, the, they all need <laughs> research. 
But I think the the as we look at the heating and cooling sector uh, and the amount of energy required for heating and cooling uh, globally, um, and the and the requirement for energy storage in order to let's say relieve the energy grids. Um, I think on the thermal side, there's still a lot needed, in particular to make these storages very compact um, and time independent. I think that would be a very uh, important research area to continue our work on. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. And the next one, which is from the chat, uh, it's, let's say, in Austria, very important questions. Which possibilities are given for SMEs for the collaboration in R&D with IEA? That's a very good question. And we, we encourage industry to participate as much as possible within the various uh, tasks and activities we have. Uh, we see the role of SMEs and business in, and industry in general as a very important in order to make sure that all the research which is being conducted need to be deployed as soon as possible. And we need industry in order to facilitate that process. This, the step from research to deployment requires companies and research uh, and, and uh, SMEs in particular to make that happen. So um, all the tasks we have are open for industries to participate. And please contact the institutes in the country uh, you're working in uh, to see how you can contribute and how you can anticipate and participate on the work in these various tasks, because the industry is, is an essential role in the step from research to deployment. And we really would invite companies to participate. Yeah, thank you very much for the replies. Uh, and yes, as mentioned, uh, the people, let's say, can uh, ask the contact persons of the uh, this uh, storage TCP in the country and it's Austria I think it's Christian Fink uh, from yeah. IAE uh, Intec in Gleisdorf or you can also ask uh, Sabine Mitter from the from the ministry uh, yeah thank you much and now we go uh, let's say uh, to the next presentation to us to the situation of energy storage in Austria uh, target images, market development, and recommendations for actions. And this will be presented by Heinz Buschmann. He's a, a colleague of mine in the Austrian Climate and Energy Fund. And he's responsible, among others, for the energy storage initiatives, which results will be presented in this presentation, and also the Smart Cities Initiative and the Renovation Program. And he will do a co-presentation together with Kurt Leonhardsberger. He's researcher at the uh, University of Applied Science Technicum Wien in the Department of Renewable Energy. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Elvira, for your introduction. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, in the next couple of minutes, I would like to give you a brief overview about the past, the present, and the future of the so-called Energy Storage Initiative hosted by the Climate and Energy Fund. The Energy Storage Initiative is one of the many contributions of the Climate and Energy Fund to the urgent topic of energy transition. One of our scopes as governmental funding institution is to act as a technology supporting knowledge base for power and heat storage systems with emphasis on research and development as well as market entry. This is the common ground of all programs within the Climate and Energy Fund. We aim to encourage Austrian innovations and enable a swift transition from science to application and market entry. The second phase of the storage initiative, which began in 2019, set a milestone for integrating and highlighting the holistic topic of sustainability in all matters revolving around storage technologies and their integration into future energy systems. Within this new framework of streamlining future storage technologies, different perspectives were taken into account. On a technological level, network serviceability, system integration, and flexibility were considered as the three main components paired with new legal and regulatory frameworks. Also new containing ecological and social aspects, such as technology assessments, ecological balancing, and social shares were drawn into the center of attention. 
the center question and central vision of the initiatives are. By 2030, we aim to incorporate storage technologies into future energy webs. How can we achieve this sustainably, efficiently, and systematically? To answer this question, a lot of content was collected, processed, and merged into 10 implementation measures over the last two years. Due to the lack of time, I can only go into individual aspects. The whole information and the report can be found on our homepage in the next weeks. Improving regulatory and legal frameworks is the first implementation measure. Why? The first implementation measure starts with a very general statement, which from our point of view fits very well uh, with the energy transition and its implementation problems. What we have to do, the existing legal framework cannot keep up with accelerated technological progress. The laws and regulatory frameworks often lag behind the technological development. And who is responsible for that to overcome this, these barriers and obstacles? Uh, the legislation and the ministries have to uh, reorganize uh, legal and regulatory frameworks conditions. And the R&D community is asked to, to develop alternative legal frameworks, especially in regulatory sandboxes. Enhancing the impact of funding towards energy transition is the second implementation measure. Why? Because business uh, and individual aspects, uh, for example, private consumption are, oft, um, are most often relevant for the funding scheme, especially for PV systems and energy storages. Economic aspects are often neglected, for example, network stability. What we have to change, what we have to do, we have to introduce new target-oriented funding mechanisms, define measurable goals and indicators to ensure the contribution to the energy transition for example, grid and uh, system serviceability and check their fulfillment. Who has to do this? Our funding agencies like the Climate and Energy Fund have to elaborate new funding schemes, for example. Ensuring data availability and interoperability. Why? Because uh, there is a progressive digitaliz digitalization in the energy sector. What we have to do, we need a fully digitized data exchange platform, which is machine readable, freely accessible and prompt. And who has to do this? All relevant stakeholders are asked to ensure interoperability, not only in Austria, but across Europe. One major goal is to provide appropriate automatic testing environments for testing and validation to ensure the functionality in practice. Developing business models and improving profitability. Why? Because uh, we need a competitive alternative to conventional fossil based, fossil fuel based storage technologies. But at the moment, alternative storages are often too expensive and fossil fuel uh, based energy is too cheap at the moment. What we have to do? In order to reduce investment and operating costs, new cost-effective materials and high durability are required. So we need a creation of appropriate energy policy frameworks conditions to enable or establish new business models at an early stage. Boosting technological development. Why? In addition uh, to improving economic efficiency, there's still a lot of potential in the area of technological progress. We need a holistic approach to develop storages driven by improvement of technical performance parameters like power density, recharging cycles, but also an ecological parameters like circular economy, eco design, and avoid toxic components. Applying lighthouse projects and pilot demonstrations why we need real life demonstrators uh, which uh, are to acquire at, uh, to accelerate the implementation of new technologies or components of it what we have to do we we need creation of innovative approaches examples like tax benefits investment subsidies 
in order to implement innovative technologies and systems on a real scale and to demonstrate their feasibility. Who has to overcome these obstacles? Uh, the R&D community and ministries uh, supporting corporate partners in the conception and submission of corresponding demonstrations and pilot projects, as well as companion research. Creating a common basis of decision-making decision and to tools and, and for planning. Why? Because the energy transition is becoming increasingly complex. There is a need for planning tools that can be used on different levels, on a building scale, on district scale, and settlement scale, on regional scale, and provide a comprehensive basis for decision-making for the use of storage systems. Raising public awareness. Why? It takes a broad public to achieve the goals of the energy transition. We need specialists uh, which are able to work as an interface to the, to the consumers. And there is an obligation to involve users in research projects, for example, by means of co-creation workshops, as well as broad-based dissemination activities. Summarizing, we need more open innovation and, and participation. Offering education and advanced training. Why? Because there is nowadays it's difficult to find highly trained specialists, especially for smaller companies. There are too few university places offers from technical colleges and universities, particularly in the secondary level and teaching, we have to create offers and revise training content. What we have to do, we have to increase the number of places for available, available in the field of renewable energy at universities of applied sciences in order to be able to provide sufficient skill workers. Who has to do this? Uh, federal guilds, education sector, ministries, enterprises, and the R&D sector have to work together. Emphasizing sustainability. Why? Because energy storages are not inherently sustainable. Especially, especially social and ecological aspects are often neglected, but are extremely relevant for broad implement, implementation. What we have to do, an increasing assessment of the contribution of technologi technologies to sustainable development is necessary. For example, uh, via life cycle assessment, technological assessment, and recognizing social and uh, impacts and aspects. Who has to do this? Uh, we need a design of corresponding interdisciplinarity research activities, uh, for, uh, like to uh, develop assessment methods with social and ecological criteria too. Yeah, that uh, was a brief overview over the, the 10 uh, implementation measures um, within the energy storage initiative. And uh, you can find uh, all um, content uh, on, the, on the website. And now, Court, could the floor is yours. Thank you, Heinz. I will now share my screen. One moment, please. So I hope you can see my screen now. Uh, yeah, hello everybody and welcome to the second part of uh, this presentation focusing on the market development of energy storage systems in Austria for the year 2020. Um, as already mentioned, my name is Kurt Leonhardsberger. I'm working at the University of Applied Science Technikum Wien where I'm responsible for the R&D area, renewable energy systems. Today, I'm happy to give you a really short overview about the results of our study called Innovative Energy Storage Technologies in Austria, Market Development 2020. I have to mention, I will do this in, on behalf of my participating colleagues and institutions, which you can see here. And the complete study was commissioned by the Austrian Ministry of Climate Action. So what was the goal of our study? Uh, the targets of our market study 
uh, were the empirical survey and documentation of the market development of selected energy storage technologies in Austria uh, in order to create the basis for the planning and decision making in politics, economy, research and development. Therefore, we investigated photovoltaic storage systems up to 50 kilowatt hour, uh, large scale heat storages in local and district heating systems, the thermal activated building parts, and last but not least, the innovative storage systems. The study was based on specific literature research, on interviews with experts, on evaluations uh, of available statistics and empirical data collect collection. And not to forget, this study was the first systematic assessment and documentation of the market development of these selected energy storage technologies in Austria. Therefore, a really essential aspect of the study was the concept and the test of the survey and analysis methods, which can be or which should be the basis for a continuous storage monitoring in Austria in the future. So let me now come to the results of our study. First of all, I would like to give you a short overview of the PV storage systems, where about 4,400 PV storage systems were installed in 2020 in Austria. Uh, this represents an installed capacity of about 57 megawatt hours. This is more than three times as much as in the previous year, as you can see in the graph on the right side. And considering also the PV storage installations in the previous years, at the end of 2020, a total of nearly 12,000 PV storage systems with a capacity of more than 120 megawatt hours were installed in Austria at the end of 2020. One of the reasons for this development are the decreasing prices for storages. In 2020, the average price of PV battery storage is decreased about 10% to about 900 euros per kilowatt hour, excluding VET. In this context, it is really interesting that subsidies still play a very important role in Austria in this area. For example, more than 90% of the installed PV storage systems received a subsidy in 2020. Now to our second technology, the large scale heat storages in local and district heating systems. Uh, this is a field where Austria has a long tradition, especially on local heating networks based on solid biomass, which started in smaller towns and villages from around 1990. Therefore, the colleagues from IE Intech surveyed a total of 875 local and district heating networks. And in 50, 572 networks, heat storage systems are already installed as a flexibility element. Uh, these storages are primarily used for operation according to techno economic criteria and for increased integration of fluctuating renewable and other waste heat. In 569 of these heating networks, a total number of 840 tank water storage systems with a total volume of more than 190,000 cubic meters were surveyed, which represent the total heat storage capacity of more than 7.8 gigawatt hours, if you take into account an average usable temperature difference of 35 Kelvin. In addition, borehole storages with a total borehole length of more than 50 kilometers were identified in three heating networks as a source storage for cold district heating networks in connection with heat pumps. Our third technology is the thermal activation of building parts where our focus was on buildings with heat pumps because activated building components and buildings are generally heated and or cooled with this technology. And to use this potential for the overriding energy system, an interface is needed to control the load to a certain amount. In Austria, heat pumps are fitted with such a smart grid ready interface since 2015. So only heat pump installations after 2015 were taken into account for this calculation. 
And as you can see here, this means that there is a low transfer potential of approximately 420 megawatt electric in more than 120,000 buildings. This means 20% more than in the previous year. Last but not least, the innovative uh, storage systems, also some information to this topic. The innovative storage systems include hydrogen storage and power to gas, innovative stationary electrical storages, such as the salt water battery, latent heat storage and thermochemical storage. Uh, as you can see in the graph on the right side, a total of 36 Austrian companies and research institutions were identified, which are researching and or offering innovative products and also key components or services in this field. And 17 of them already offer products on the Austrian market, 19 are still in the research phase. And as you can see here on the right side, the main part of the identified companies and research institutions are dealing with hydrogen, followed by innovative stationary electrical storage. So finally, let me come to my last slide where you can find the contact information of the experts which were responsible for the selected storage technologies in the studies. So if you have uh, specific questions to a certain technology, please don't hesitate to contact me and my colleagues. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Now I had to run, people didn't see it. Uh, <laughs> um, I take a look if there are questions in the chat. Okay, maybe then I ask the first one. Uh, you can decide who wants to reply. The first one, in which technology or innovation field do we have a competitive advantage in Austria according to your opinion? It's a, it's a really good question and not so easy to answer. I think uh, we have strong a strong research and also strong companies in the field of uh, of heat uh, water storage systems, but also in the field of uh, battery storage systems. Uh, more and more companies in Austria are doing research in this field, offering services, key components, and so on. Okay. Now I don't I don't see the question. Are there no questions? Okay. Then the next one uh, is. I'm prepared. Uh, Henriette Spiro said that more women in energy research are needed. And it was also mentioned, let's say, uh, as one of the key results that offering education and training is necessary. And now my question, which trends do you see at university? And this is to Kurt Leonhard Berger. And maybe uh, then uh, Heinz Buschmann also can say his ideas. What can be done that uh, to attract more women to do research or work in the energy storage field? Do you already have any ideas out of the energy storage initiative? I would like to try to answer the first question. Uh, in the last years, we see a, a trend that more and more uh, women come to our uh, University of Applied Science, which is the biggest technical university uh, of applied science in Austria. And uh, this trend increases every year. I don't find the exact numbers at the moment, but uh, as far as I'm concerned in the last year, uh, we had so many new uh, female applicants for our studies like never before. So this is a real positive trend. And Heinz Buschmann, do you uh, let's say also have some input? Because you're working, let's say, also in a company where are quite many women. <laughs> uh, we are now working on an initiative for 2022, uh, which deals with this uh, obstacle, and we have uh, um, we want to overcome that and to bring more diversity to the energy sector. Uh, we are still working on this, and, and the work is is ongoing, but I have no details yet. Okay. But let's see, we can say more to come uh, next year. Okay. That's for sure. Then thank you very much to both of you. And now the, the last presentation um, in this session, uh, it's on uh, 
it's the uh, project Underground Sun Storage, and it is the sto uh, it's on underground storage of hydrogen and the conversion uh, to methane. And now I said the wrong, because the title of the project is Underground Sun Conversions. You have too many projects already. Uh, and it will be presented by Stefan Bauer. Uh, he's head of uh, the Green Gas Technology Department at uh, RAG Austria G. And it is one of the leading gas storage operators in, in Europe. And what I can say for sure, that it's the, one of the most innovative uh, gas storage operators worldwide. And now it, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Elvira. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, can you see my screen already? Is it in the correct mode? No. No. Uh, I have to switch that. It's okay now? Yes, now it's okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, welcome to my presentation, which is on underground storage of hydrogen and conversion to methane, a large scale interseasonal um, storage solution we are developing. And to start with a um, short company profile, Elvira already told you that we are among the leading uh, gas storage operators in Europe. And just to give you a few numbers, our operating volume is six, some 6 billion cubic meters of gas and the unload and upload capacity is 30 gigawatt, which just to give a comparison is something like 100 hydropower plants at the River Danube, uh, just to, to give you uh, an, an indication that this is really an important part of the energy system in, in, in Europe. And what we try to do is we want to uh, further develop our services in order to be able to uh, yeah, serve a renewable energy system to, to really store um, renewable energy in our uh, infrastructure and and uh, yeah further develop our assets. Uh, talking about gas storage, how does this work? In our case, it's uh, depleted natural gas reservoirs we utilize for energy storage, and uh, that's that's some porous uh, geological structures covered with tight gas tight clay layers. And uh, nature itself gave the perfect proof that these structures are gas tight because gas was stored there in there for, for several millions of years. And the question now is, uh, why should we store renewable energy in such uh, geological structures and how do we do it? I always try to explain um, with a, a graph uh, why we should store or why we need to store renewable energy in in large amounts and uh, and which is only suitable with with or possible with with underground storage this time i i brought a, a graph from our swiss project partners uh, showing the swiss electricity system in the future in some degrees the Swiss uh, or Switzerland is comparable to Austria uh, in others not. Uh, they try to get rid of their uh, nuclear power plants and replace it with, with uh, PV electricity. And what happens is that um, uh, that uh, the generation of electricity uh, is um, is uh, uh, generates a, a huge surplus during summer months, um, which is indicated uh, by the yellow uh, columns. Um, uh, the blue columns is the is the hydropower plants, and there is a certain gap between, uh, let's say, uh, the, uh, the the red lines indicate the the uh, electricity demand. Uh, the full red line is the um, actual um, base consumption of electricity throughout the year. And uh, they also modeled um, an, an, let's say, an increase in electricity demand by, uh, uh, by changing the heat market, the, the space heating market to electrical driven heat pumps. And what you see is that during winter months, there is an even increased um, 
electricity demand and the gap between generation and and demand is even larger so what it what is needed is a uh, interseasonal balancing instrument and a storage option that can shift a uh, surplus from the summer months uh, to the winter months and that's exactly what we are working for we need a power to gas uh, technology during summer months and the gas to power technology uh, during winter months uh, that's essential for for a future um, energy system and that's just the electricity system so we're not uh, we but we have an, we have even more challenges because we also want to uh, turn industry and and uh, yeah to and and heavy duty mobility to towards renewables and uh, the challenge is even larger than displayed in this in this graph. Uh, what is another hint I want to give? What is written here? Imports during winter months. We have to imagine that all uh, Central European countries, all let's say countries on the northern hemisphere, have a pretty similar uh, challenge, and it's not wise to. Uh, to just rely on imports during winter months because who is generating renewable electricity during winter months? We really have to ask this question. Now, RAC has developed uh, some concepts how to solve the, this issue. And uh, one is the underground sun storage concepts. Both uh, all those concepts rely on this power to gas approach. One is the underground sun storage approach so where directly hydrogen is stored in depleted reservoirs. The second approach is the underground sun conversion approach where hydrogen together with CO2 is injected in, the, in, in, in depleted reservoirs and there a microbial process takes place converting to those substrate gases to methane. And recently we uh, added uh, a third concept which we call CCIS, carbon capture and intermediate storage because we figured that if we want to uh, do certain uh, chemical synthesis products, yeah, like, like methanol, ethanol, uh, e-fuels, um, proteins, whatever, it might be useful to have a, a storage for the feed gases, for the carbon uh, uh, feed, uh, because those synthesis processes run on a flat level and uh, need a secured supply of, of carbon. Here is an overview of all the projects or the major projects we are running. Uh, the, the first five are related to the underground sun storage um, concept and the underground sun conversion concept. All those projects uh, receive or received funding by the Austrian Climate and Energy Fund. Uh, money provided by the uh, Austrian Ministry for Climate Action. So thank you for that, because that gives really the opportunity to put Austria in a front runner position in that uh, technologies. And the last two projects represent um, European projects also dealing with uh, hydrogen storage in depleted porous reservoirs. Um, and that uh, gives the indication that also on European level, this is uh, uh, of, of gaining uh, attraction, this, this topic. Let me start with the underground sun storage project. It was our initial project. Uh, we, at that time, um, injected 10% of hydrogen. That was the major discussion at that time. The entire European gas infrastructure uh, researched or, or investigated on how much hydrogen is acceptable, acceptable for the for the infrastructure we did for the underground gas storage. The, uh, the results are available as a download. What were the major results or the most relevant results for further um, for, the, for the next projects, for follow-up projects? Most of the uh, lab studies were done with 100% hydrogen already. And in the meantime, we, all, we tested all the steel grades for, for our well completion uh, for 100% hydrogen, 100 bar partial pressure. And we did not observe any curtailment of integrity so far. And also the field experiments uh, were performed without any anomalies. So this puts us in a position where we can really 
uh, start with 100% uh, uh, pure hydrogen storage in uh, depleted natural gas um, reservoir. And from that original project, we also got evidence for geomethanation, and that was the basis for our sun conversion project. But let me stay with the underground sun storage uh, technology. Our ongoing project is the underground sun storage 2030 project. Uh, in the course of the uh, energy model region, V for power and gas. Again, we start on the left side with a power to gas approach, injecting hydrogen in a depleted natural gas reservoir. When we withdraw the uh, gas again, uh, mostly during winter time, we, we investigate on three pathways. One is replacing natural gas uh, by hydrogen in the public gas grid. Another one is to purify the hydrogen in order to receive more or less uh, fuel cell quality and to provide uh, a fuel for, for those applications. And the third option is to directly go to uh, the uh, uh, energy intensive industry, especially the steel industry. Uh, on the uh, left side, you can see some basic facts and figures about this project. Uh, what are the general objectives of that Underground Sun Storage 2030 project? Of course, we want to develop an interseasonal energy storage solution based on pure hydrogen. We want to prove the technical feasibility by doing a field experiment or field research facility again. Uh, of course, we want to see if those uh, results from the field experiment are in, in line with the, uh, with the results from, from lab experiments. And we want to uh, demonstrate and de develop and demonstrate a purification system. And of course, we have several uh, site uh, investigations going on. A uh, quite large consortium is doing this project and about the funding I already told you. Um, let me uh, switch to the underground sun conversion uh, uh, approach. Um, I already told we want to inject hydrogen or we do inject hydrogen and CO2 to uh, this depleted natural gas reservoir. There a microbial process takes place converting hydrogen and CO2 to methane and water. And then of course, when we uh, use that methane, uh, CO2 is emitted again, and, uh, but, not, but just to an amount which was uh, fixed to the process before. So we can describe a sustainable and closed carbon loop with, with such a technology. Uh, this project is finished already. Uh, I'm still working on the final report. I hope I can make it until Christmas and then it will be available on the listed um, uh, website. Uh, but we, uh, yeah, here you can see uh, some pictures of this nice field test facility. Um, yeah, a lot of details to tell, but uh, not not much, not much, not enough time for that. Um, another, uh, yeah, a few results about this project. Uh, here are some results from our partner, University of uh, Bodenkultur. Um, they tested several gas mixtures in those um, uh, high pressure reactors, and uh, you can see that, uh, yeah. Uh, often repeated those experiments, a very stable process in the, in the lab, uh, and you have an indication about the time uh, frame where this reaction takes place. Um, in the field experiments, it's a little bit more complex. Uh, also there, the geomethanation works. We have several lines of evidence for that. For instance, we have a genetic proof of metanogenic metabolism uh, by genetic methods. We observe a shift in the microbiological consortium, which also indicates that there is a metanogenesis going on, and also changes in the uh, composition of uh, carbon isotopes. And then the most interesting thing is the, the, let's say the balancing of gases going in and out. And what we observe is that, of course, we take a lot of hydrogen out again, uh, but uh, uh, just from calculating, there would remain some hydrogen in, in the reservoir. 
And of course, from, from uh, observing the gas composition when taking the gas out, you can calculate that there is not so much hydrogen in the reservoir. Uh, so there is a gap and this represents the, the um, uh, hydrogen which was converted to methane. Another project is the carbon cycle economy demonstration project. It's a an, an, uh, follow-up project of the underground sun conversion uh, project. And here we want to really integrate different CO2 sources. We want to demonstrate a full carbon loop on different locations and, and place the sun conversion technology in that uh, full carbon cycle. Again, a project in the uh, VIFA uh, energy model region performed with a lot of partners. The conclusion, uh, yeah, uh, if we further uh, increase renewable energy generation, we will also generate additional demand in seasonal and high capacity large scale energy storage options. We think that underground sun storage as well as underground sun conversion technology are a part of that uh, puzzle and, and might solve the, the, this, this challenge in the future energy system. And uh, yeah, underground gas storage will remain an essential part of uh, Europe's security of energy supply. So we are confident that we can uh, yeah, contribute to a future energy system and that was my presentation. Thank you for listening. And yeah, any questions are welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, and we have some uh, questions in the chat. When do you think energy from power to gas technologies will be able to compete economically with natural gas? Uh, that's a big question. <laughs> I think the existing regulatory framework is not uh, sufficient for, for being competitive yet. Uh, I think we need to further increase renewable energy generation uh, to really uh, generate that surplus during summer months. Uh, that's the, the first uh, yeah, uh, indication we need. Uh, and then I think it depends on the and the CO2 emission price. Uh, if it pays off to really store renewable energy during summer months and replace fossil energy during winter months, uh, that that is a very um, uh, sufficient, let's say, factor which would help to uh, to um, uh, get this technology in place. Yeah. Thank you. Then uh, another one is, uh, what is the efficiency of the, I would say, not power to gas, but the underground sun storage, underground sun conversion system currently? And where do you want to go? Well, the efficiency of an underground gas storage system is, is quite high. I mean, it's, it's something beyond 90% for uh, storing natural gas for Hydrogen, we are still looking because that's, of course, uh, also part of the underground sun storage only 30 project to, to get some numbers there. Um, so the, the uh, efficiency of gas storing is, is quite high. Of course, the overall efficiency of a powered gas um, proce uh, procedure is, is not that high. But we always have to keep in mind what is the efficiency of a windmill that is uh, not able to produce because the electricity cannot be placed in the system. It's zero and everything is better than zero. And, and as I said, we need to uh, have a solution for, for providing power during winter months. And I think there, there are not too many solutions for that. Yeah. So that let's say there is the space for all of these technologies because the, the energy trans transformation to reach 100% um, renewable energy, yeah, yeah. let's but say, uh, it's... I, I still want to mention that, of course, it is wise to use electricity as electricity if there is uh, uh, an actual need for that in the, in, in, at that time, yeah? Uh, so just to produce hydrogen for the sake of hydrogen, it, it doesn't make sense to, to run an, electroly an electrolysis during winter months because that is just additional electricity demand at a time where, where 
yeah, the generation by renewables is not sufficient. Yeah, thank you very much. Then uh, we have two further questions. I, um, I would ask you if you could reply directly uh, in the chat. Uh, and because we have the virtual coffee break. Uh, yes, please come back uh, at 11.15. Uh, the next uh, session then will be moderated by, by Karin uh, Ganzer-Sudorf from ÖGUT, the Austrian Society for Environment and Technology. And yes, that, that was my part. Hope to see you soon live and enjoy your coffee. Thank you. So welcome back after this virtual coffee break. My name is Karin Granzer Sutra from the Austrian Society for Environment and Technology. And I'm here today to replace Christian Fink from the AEE Intech. He was to, supposed to moderate this session, but unfortunately, according to this uh, sit corona situation, he couldn't come to Vienna. So uh, in this session, we will now continue with uh, three presentations. And for the first presentation, I would like to introduce Hannes Heigl. Hannes Heigl works in the solar energy sector at Fronis International. He was responsible for the development of the first PV storage inverter. Now he is the head of the development area system engineering of the business unit solar energy. And today he will talk about the combination of different storage systems as a key factor for decarbonization. Hannes Heigl, the stage is yours. Yeah, hello also from my side, hello here from, from Upper Austria. Today I want to talk about uh, storage as a key component for uh, energy supply with uh, distributed energy systems. So as already mentioned today, uh, storage is, is really a big, a big field. Uh, and to see the importance of, of this uh, topic, you have to look at uh, storage on a system level. That's really important and therefore I now use uh, a picture which uh, is out of the Austrian technology roadmap uh, for storage and really give a good overview about the different uh, technologies which are used there. This picture has three major dimensions where we have to look on it. One is of course the generation because it's a major difference for storage uh, if uh, the energy is generated of a distributed energy system of a small PV system or on a big windmill or, for example, we talk about uh, thermal uh, energy production. Another dimension which is important to look at the right storage system is the consumption, of course, because also there we have uh, differences between uh, households, residential systems, uh, industry or uh, mobile solutions where we need the energy. And between this, we of course have the distribution, how to bring the energy from the generation to the consumption. And there we have different grids and different logistic concepts to bring the energy there. And all of this is uh, relevant to choose the right storage and to operate the storages in the right way. So from the uh, from decentralized to centralized. And therefore, as I said, you always have to look at the system level. At Fronius, we also uh, think about uh, this energy supply, and therefore we have uh, worked on our solution 24 hours of sun, where we aimed the target to have energy supply out of this uh, decentralized power production. 
And when we look at our picture, of, at our vision, we have the same dimensions there. We have the generation, so the effective uh, generation of power. We have the distribution, how to bring the energy from the production to the, to the consumer. We have the intelligent consumption. And we have the storage there as a major component as well. At here, uh, at Fronius, we have uh, also built our own picture on this energy generator. Uh, it's not that complex that the picture out of the energy of the technology roadmap, but we have the same components. So we have on the left side the energy production. In our case, it's PV. We have the different uh, mediums how to to distribute the energy. So electrical. Uh, distribution, thermal or hydrogen, for example. And of course, we have the consumption, the electrical loads, heating, uh, mobility, and so on. And in this picture, which is part of our, of our vision, we have different uh, storage components. Of course, we have a battery storage as a short-term component, uh, as a short-term storage component for a balancing of day and night, or also for uh, balancing of short peaks, short peak demands. Uh, we have, of course, thermal storage, which is also very important because it's an addition uh, technology to these uh, batteries, uh, especially if you have a high demand of uh, energy, then you can store it there. Or it's also uh, cheaper to, to store energy there in such a, a thermal system. For long term, we are working on uh, hydrogen storage systems. Uh, these are these ones are specially used if you want to store uh, energy for more than a few days, for weeks, for months, or if you want to have a balance between summer and winter, which is especially for, for Europe an interesting uh, topic. But there are other storage systems here on this picture. So we have this mobile storage, especially if you have this decision when you charge uh, cars or uh, vehicles, then uh, you also can use them as a big storage uh, additional to, to other components. And for us, it's very important to, to operate, operate them also as, as a storage system and to store them uh, in the right way and to the right time. And there we... We can look at electrical cars as well as hydrogen vehicles uh, with a huge demand, especially compared to stationary batteries or storage systems. When we look at research uh, at Fronius concerning the batteries, we look on uh, three major dimensions uh, or three major topics or fields where we look on. One is storage management, to store uh, the energy in the right way, on the right time, and most efficient, of course. Then, for us, very important energy conversion, to have the energy in the right form, to use it in the different storage systems. And for uh, another thing is business models, uh, which uh, are located around of the storage systems. So you can see uh, we at Fronius do not directly uh, research on battery systems, but on fields which are really, really relevant, especially on a system level around these uh, technologies. For us, batteries normally we use state-of-the-art technology, but do not do any research directly on them. And here you can see a, a short overview on different projects, funded projects together with uh, different companies and research institutes where we work on the different fields. Some of the projects are focused on one of these, these topics uh, and some of the projects are cover more of these topics. You know. So in the next few minutes, I want to look a little bit closer in three or four of these uh, projects to give you a little bit more impression what we are working in this in these projects. First of all, we, we look at Flex Plus. It's an Austrian project. Uh, and there we are pooling energy or we pooling uh, components 
uh, out in the field to uh, to do some service on the uh, energy system and to to sell the energy there on on different kind of markets, prim primarily a market or intraday market and so on. Uh, in the project, we look at different pools, heat pumps, boilers, e-cars, and our focus there is on batteries. Uh, and for us, this project is really important, especially if you look uh, at the moment, we have more than 10,000 uh, 10, decentralized battery systems, which are already connected to our inverters and connected to our controlling uh, platform. Uh, they do, we do not use them as a pool, but the potential is really uh, high there to use these batteries. Another, uh, and you can see uh, on our three topics, uh, this project is used for, for storage management. So we try to store the battery, uh, the energy in the right time, in the right way. And of course, we look there very close to different business models. A different project, which also is very close to, to storage systems, is our Heisner project, where we do some on-site production of hydrogen directly in the, uh, in the Alpine area, and we store it there to use it in uh, snowmobiles. Uh, and it's not that easy, of course, to do this decentralized storage, to do this decentralized uh, production, especially uh, as you can see it on the picture, we have an alpine area, we have a rough uh, area there, and we need, uh, we have to have enough energy there or enough hydrogen there to, to run all the snowmobiles, uh, which are, are needed during the whole day. So a lot of uh, research was necessary also to, to have this in the field. But now it's already working for yeah, around two years. Uh, and we really learn a lot of the operating data from them. Another project, totally different, but also for a mobile solution is Cartoflex. Uh, there we uh, look at energy conversion. So for Fronius, the focus is, is on energy conversion. So we use our components, our inverters, our, our technology to have a uh, bidirectional charging system for electric cars, so we can charge them, we can de uh, discharge them. Um, and it's not just a, a research project to, to try this in a laboratory, but also we, we plan to have this uh, out in the field in different use cases, uh, car sharing in fleet management for bigger buildings where we have not just one of these charging points, but also a lot. And there we can uh, really do a lot of, of uh, research uh, to find out what is the right time to charge the, the cars, uh, how many potential is there to uh, charge or discharge the cars. And so this project pays to all of our three dimensions, storage management, how to charge and discharge, energy conversion, because we convert the energy from AC to, to DC to the, to the car. And of course, we also look at business models how uh, we can sell uh, this energy, this stored energy again on a grid level. In this project also, uh, grid operators are involved. So we're not just uh, looking on selling the energy, but also looking how we can uh, support the grid uh, out of this electric cars. So, and last but not least, uh, another example, it's a bigger example complained to the others, uh, user grids. There, we, we plan to optimize a whole city district in Graz uh, by using uh, algorithms, by, lose, uh, by using uh, predictive uh, analyzing systems uh, to really get out the maximum, or to get out the, the right amount of, of power at the right time to have the right storage uh, and not too much storage in the field and uh, to combine different storage systems as well. So there we talk about mobile storage, uh, thermal storage, uh, electrochemical storage, and all of them are combined in the city district. And we try to use them in the uh, ideal way. So 
I can talk hours and hours about our projects because this is really a lot which are relevant to storage. But this should give you just a short overview uh, that we always look on a system level on storage and how important it is to look at the system level uh, on storage to have the right storage technologies. So electrochemical storage, thermal storage, mobile storage for the right solution, centralized, decentralized, and always to store it in the right way. Thank you. Thank you very much for these very interesting insights into these uh, various projects. Um, right now I've got one question from the chat for you. Can you speci specify your hydrogen long-term storage system? Uh, yeah, when we talk about uh, hydrogen long-term storage, we also look there on a decentral uh, look there on, with a decentralized uh, focus, because uh, as you see, all of our components are are focused there on a decentralized production, on a decentralized storage, and uh, the use of, of energy on decentralized way. Uh, and we therefore have built up a so-called uh, soul hub, where we can produce the energy uh, directly, where it uh, is produced out of. Uh, renewable energy sources or, or different sources, uh, we can store it there and we can use it there, for example, in uh, electric or in, in uh, hydrogen cars or in uh, buses or trucks. And what we also can do there is to uh, bring it to a, a fuel cell and make out uh, energy again, especially for this uh, seasonal storage concepts. So we combined the, the different uh, ways of storing and uh, converting the energy. Okay, thank you. So there are some more questions uh, from the chat right now. Um, are car to flex solutions looking for extensions of their integration in the market, for example, by interoperability? Interoper uh, yeah, uh, Cartoflex is really a big project. So our focus, of course, is on the converting technology. But uh, in the whole project, we also look uh, what we can do uh, by using these uh, decentralized uh, storage systems, because we talk about a really uh, high amount of, of electric cars. We talk about a big electrochemical storage of around 50 up to now we talk about 100 kilowatt hours and of course it's really important how to use this to support the energy system or to sell the energy in, in different ways so this is also one of the focus and uh, another focus we also or i also should mention is the the user experience or the user involvement into this uh, into the systems because normally the the car owner is is the user and it's always important to, to get him a, a good feeling that uh, what, what happens with his car or with the car to get uh, him a good impression of what he can, uh, can do with his car and what are the, the benefits directly for him. Okay, thank you. Maybe uh, we can answer one more question. Can you speak about the advantages or disadvantages of distributed storage compared to centralized storage? Oh, this is a really a big question. Um, <laughs> first, I, I think I should say that uh, we do not, we should not talk about the one or the other because it's always a combination of technology which is needed. And uh, as I tried to mention, we. Uh, always should look uh, about the the different uh, the different uh, things which affects the storage uh, first, and then we can decide which is the right storage system. So we always have to look how is the energy produced there? How uh, is it necessary to distribute the energy, or do we talk about local use uh, or the, the way of consumption of the energy? And then you can decide the right 
uh, way of, of storage. For example, if you have a local production and the local consumption of the energy, it makes really sense to have a local uh, storage system. If you talk about distribution and you talk about bigger systems, uh, city districts and so on, then it makes sense to have, or it might have sen uh, make sense to have uh, different storage systems, bigger storage systems in field, because uh, they are more uh, efficient for this solution. So it's not an easy answer to have the advantage or disadvantage, but you have the right storage solution for the right uh, business case or the right use case. Okay, thank you very much. So we have some more questions in the chat. Maybe you have time to answer them directly in the chat. And now I would like to move on. Um, for the next uh, lecture, I would like to introduce two speakers now. This is uh, Wim van Helden. He's leading the Department of Technology Development at AEE Intech and is also manager of the IEA's Energy Storage Task 39. Uh, Joseph Dieter Dijks is the Chief Operating Officer of Power Bau GmbH and responsible for engineering there. So uh, they will talk about large-scale heat storage now, and I'm happy and, and very looking forward to your presentation now. The next 15 minutes, you will hear more about the technology, the technology developments uh, on large thermal energy storages, both in Austria and also an outlook to international developments. Next slide, please. So why would we have large thermal energy storages? Um, because we all have the goal in the long term to have 100% renewable energy generation. And the energy sources for renewables are um, intermittent, meaning that not always all energy is available and therefore we need flexibility in the system. And as depicted here to the right in the picture, the flexibility is given by thermal energy storages for the part of district heating systems or for industrial heat. There is, however, a large variation in operational conditions. So it's, it's either short-term or long-term, middle size or very large heating systems. And we want to have a grip on how to design and to plan and to operate such large thermal storages. Next slide, please. So uh, four years ago, we had the opportunity to start the GigaTest project. It's a flagship project, uh, three and a half years. We worked with a very broad consortium on uh, very large thermal energy storages with basis, the developments in Denmark. As you see in the left picture, in Denmark already since 20 years, uh, large thermal energy storages have been developed, mainly in combination with solar thermal systems and uh, medium sized district heating systems and depicted here in the left is the largest until now which has a capacity of 200,000 cubic meters. So the aim of the GigaTest project was to um, the, investigate the possibilities of having such large and even larger thermal energy storage in the middle of Europe, middle Europe and especially in Austria. Next slide please. So what, has, what is, are the advantages of having a larger thermal storage? Of course, the need for heat is larger, so we need uh, large storages, but they also have the advantage that if you go larger, the relative heat losses are lower. You can see this uh, also in the picture that another uh, advantage is the uh, economy of scale. So realizing a uh, storage like, uh, for instance, in, in Voyance, the most uh, recent one, 200,000 cubic meter has a lower cost per um, kilowatt hour stored than the smaller storages. But Denmark has special conditions uh, and Austria has, has uh, other conditions. And therefore we would like to in investigate what is needed to realize these storages in Austria. Next slide, please. The consortium consisted of, of uh, different groups of, uh, of industries and research organizations. Um, in fact, we had all the industries that uh, uh, can be involved in the uh, value chain of uh, large thermal energy storages. 
We have um, companies, building companies, we have engineering companies, and also companies providing the materials for the different uh, uh, components of the system. And then we were also um, supported by two foreign uh, research uh, organizations, Plan Energy and Solites from Denmark and Germany, respectively. Next slide, please. The development challenges are broad. Um, what we need to uh, consider is that in Austria, the groundwater levels are relatively high. So building below the groundwater level is needed. And also in order to have the surface area of the storage as small as possible, because the cover is the most expensive part, we should build deeper. And in order to increase the capacity of the storage, we also need to uh, store the temperature uh, to store at higher temperatures. So this means that for the materials and constructions, there are more strict boundary conditions and um, we had then different development areas in which we uh, focused our development attention. So polymer materials, concrete, and wall building constructions. And especially about this uh, wall buildings constructions, uh, you will hear more now in the next part of this presentation by Dieter Dijks. Okay, I'll take over, ladies and gentlemen. Next slide, please. I would like to say a warm Chris Gott also from Austria, from my home office due to COVID. I'm pleased to be able to give you an overview of the construction uh, structural engineering uh, research work on the large scale heat storage. Next slide, please. What is POR? POR is a construction company in the with, the, with the focus in Central Europe. I would like to draw your attention, especially on the second line the pioneer spirit, the claim to technology, leadership and the sustainability are part of our DNA. These three characters lead us directly into the actual topic of the lecture. Next slide, please. Energy storage is one of the key topics of the future. That's why we were immediately hooked when we were asked to participate in the TIGATES project 2017. Uh, the key data was given by Wim, so please, next slide. First, uh, feasibility studies and cost analysis uh, of individual construction methods were carried out. Regardless to the construction method, we, whether embanked uh, cylindrical sealers or hybrid versions, all led us to the central team. How to prevent heat loose in the environment and how to protect the groundwater from heating up. Next slide, please. One possible solution is an insulating board by wall. For this, piles are driven into the subsole and uh, trailed into the subsole and filled with insulation material. We decided to use form glass. So since form glass is lighter than water, an additional ceiling wall uh, and a water drainage system must be constructed in advance. The water rowing is operated permanently to uh, maintain the terminal insulation properties. Next slide, please. Um, since the construction method has not been carried out, uh, we decided to uh, try it out in large scale tests. One serious test uh, um, uh, involved the insulation board pie wall. Two materials were chosen for backfill, uh, cement bound glass form and loose glass form. Another problem is the connection of the plastic ceiling tapes with the uh, high temperatures. Also, a possible solution was found and tested in situ. Due to the narrow time window, I will only deal with the insulation, insulating board pile wall. Next slide, please. The sketch shows uh, uh, the experimental, uh, experimental arrangement. In the first, we uh, uh, had a trench or trench was made, which uh, was filled with the respective material. Uh, this was drilled over and both the internal and the external stability, uh, stability of the medium was checked. In phase two, the real situation was simulated in, uh, during uh, operation. Uh, I can say in advance, uh, both tests uh, were carried out uh, completely positivity, uh, posit positively. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, I would like to show you now a few pictures of our uh, on-field testing. 
In the left picture, you can see the mixed in carbon of the bound glass form. Uh, in the middle, you can see the backfilling of the trench with the uh, bound glass form. And in the right picture, the same uh, procedure uh, with the loose glass form, which was compacted. Next slide, please. Uh, on the left side, you can see the drilling uh, operation, uh, the cable excavator with the casing machine and the drill pipe during uh, 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 drilling the piles. Uh, in the middle, you can see the first uh, installed insulation pile. And on the right side, you can see the over um, over drilled insulation pile, which when one lined up, uh, formed the insulation wall. Next slide, please. Now the experimental procedure again with the loose material. Uh, left side, the drilling. We also use the drilling rig uh, to see what uh, fits better to, to the glass form. Uh, in the middle, the back filling of the, uh, with the loose material. And on the right side, uh, the compaction during uh, filling with a compaction blade. Next slide, please. Of course, uh, various uh, measurements and quality insurance measures were carried out during the test. Uh, Penetrometer tests and borehole uh, measurements are cited here as example. On the picture on the right side, you can see an ele elevation of the borehole measurement. As already mentioned, the feasibility was confirmed. Next slide, please. Finally, I can, uh, it can be said that uh, the results from, with the results of the research, we are ready to build such a large scale uh, storage facility. Thank you for your attention and uh, back to Wim. Yeah, thanks Dieter. And, and what I would like to stress is uh, two things. Um, first, is, this is only one part of the, the, the research that was done within the GIGITES project. And we will come back later to more information on this project. And the second one is uh, perhaps we did not sketch that uh, enough, but uh, you saw from the sizes of the machines used that we are really talking about very big structures. And um, the Gikites project is really a, a say a forward looking project in, in the terms that we are investigating structures that have never been uh, realized before. So it's, it's really uh, say, uh, top of the spear um, research at, at the moment. Going into international developments for large thermal energy storage, uh, as you already heard from, from Turn also, um, there is an, uh, a task 39 or in the energy storage uh, technology collaboration program of the IEA. Um, it's, it's handling about large thermal energy storage for district heating, and it's a, a three-year duration task. It started uh, last year, October. The idea of such a task is that international experts um, work together on common goals in order to forward the uh, status of, of the research field. And in this case, at the moment, we have 45 experts from 11 countries that participate in the task. Next slide, please. So the task goal, uh, task 39 goal is that uh, and we would like to determine those aspects that are important in several phases of a large thermal energy storage. So planning, design, decision-making, and realizing uh, of those LTES for integration into district heating or perhaps also industrial processes, given a range of boundary conditions for the different locations and the different system configurations. Next uh, slide, please. So then the objective is that we first have an idea about how to apply the heat that uh, is stored in such a sto storage, what are the boundary conditions, and then make some example boundary uh, conditions applications, and also to improve the materials that are being used and how the materials are tested for use in those uh, systems to prepare also guidelines on what the water quality should be in such uh, systems and uh, other material qualities and how to obtain such a quality to uh, compare or to be able to compare how the storages function through numerical simulation. There are a lot of simulation models now used and the idea is that through round robin tests, we will compare those uh, different simulation models. And then from this comparison to derive validation tests 
to see which, which uh, simulation models are appropriate for a given situation and to generate, last but not least, information material for decision makers. Next slide, please. So the scope is that we look at four different types of storages, the tank thermal energy storage, the pit thermal energy storages, like you uh, have seen in the GigaTest project, then borehole thermal energy storage and aquifer thermal energy storage. And we look uh, principally at, at storages that have a higher volume and that are applied into district heating systems or in industries. Next slide, please. These are some examples. You saw the GigaTest. This is one of the uh, arrangements, concepts for a GigaTest storage with a volume of 1 million cubic meter. Another example is a development from the Ecovat company in the Netherlands, in which they have a prefabricated method of uh, making storages underground up to 90,000 cubic meters. Next slide, please. This is the, the work division into the different work packages. Below, you see the most important work package, which is knowledge base for decision makers, because at the end of the project, we would like to have all those knowledge that decision makers need to know to make a proper decision whether or not to integrate uh, thermal energy storage into their district heating system or industrial process. Next slide, please. Very shortly, uh, next steps in the task, we were working on the round robin simulations. Uh, we are working on a questionnaire that we send around in December and uh, have a concept for the materials database that is being erected. More information can be found on the website of the task. And we have a next expert meeting on 8th April uh, in 2022 in Graz, Austria. And then the next slide, last slide, is on more information on the GigaTest project. You only saw a small part of the information that we generated. More can be heard in German uh, next week, uh, Tuesday, 13 November, from 9.30 to 12.30. And you can uh, find through the AE Intech website events uh, how to uh, um, sign in for this uh, webinar. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for these insights in the GigaTest project and uh, IA task 39 and uh, Paul Agi. Um, right now we have uh, one question uh, concerning the GigaTest project. Do you perform uh, life cycle analysis in your project? At the moment, no, we did not okay. perform the LCA. Um, so we know which materials are in. We also developed a cost tool. So there's a, say an inventory of all the materials that are used uh, for a different, uh, for, or for a certain building concept. So in, in fact, we have all the say data available in order to feed uh, an LCA uh, program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, what about the costs? Do you have an idea what could the implementation and the running of the system uh, cost. Yes, um, we, we have an idea. Um, the, the, the point is, and um, you already heard it in, in, in the presentation, that the boundary conditions for Middle Europe are not the ideal boundary conditions. They can be found in Denmark, and the actual costs in Denmark are very low. So it's impossible for Middle European conditions with high groundwater and the groundwater protection rules to have arrangements uh, that have uh, the lower low cost that are in Denmark. So mm -hmm. the cost will be a factor two at least uh, higher. And we also see this from the first uh, cost tool uh, calculations that we did. But uh, also there is uh, room for further improvement. The big challenge for, for this uh, very large thermal energy storage is, is that uh, we cannot just uh, try it uh, because it's a lot of investment. If you talk about, say, 1 million cubic meter storage, it's more than 50 million euro, meaning that okay. no, no company will, will make this investment if there is a large uncertainty. So we mm -hmm. need to make several next steps in order to increase the size of uh, experimental or pilot storage in order to address the uh, questions that are at the table at the moment. So uh, are the concepts uh, proper? Are the processes for building it uh, proper? Are the logistics uh, possible? And uh, can we 
achieve a, a lower price than at the moment estimated. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, there's another question um, about the consumers, customers of your uh, energy from this system. Um, do you know who these uh, customers could be? Maybe? Uh, Dieter, perhaps? It's uh, your microphone. Uh, of course, uh, the government, uh, the, 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 for, for example, Graz or, or, or Vienna, and, and these are our customers, of course, because we, we tried out to, to solve uh, storage the, the heat uh, during, during the, the summer and, and, and spend the, the heat in the winter, for example, for, for, um, for heating up the, the buildings and, uh, and, uh, and so on. So most of uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the cities, of course, uh, mm -hmm. the big cities, of course, that's the, 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 that is the customers of, of, our, of our projects. Okay, thank you very much because we have a quite ambitious agenda. I have to move on uh, to our next presentation. Thank you thank very you. much. You're welcome. So now uh, I would like to uh, introduce two speakers for the last presentation in this session. This is Roland Zoll. He's responsible for smart grid topics in the research projects at the Department Network Planning, at Electricity and Telecommunication at Wiener Netze. And Christian Messner, he's working at the Austrian Institute for of technology with the research focus in the field of battery energy storage systems, laboratory and field tests. And they both will talk about battery storage for urban distribution networks. So the stage is yours. So just share my screen. I hope you can see it now. Welcome from my side. Um, to our presentation, battery storage for the urban distribution network. Um, so we will give today a little bit an overview about um, the, <clears throat> yes, let's say starting from the procurement process of several battery systems, which Dina Netze installed in their system, in their grid to support the electricity grid. And we as AIT um, did also acceptance testing and uh, we will give you a little bit an overview about experiences learned in, uh, yeah, in the process from the procurement and until the acceptance testing. So um, at the beginning, what um, yes, are our experiences um, especially at the start, when you start um, the procurement process, so that it's quite important to write a detailed technical system specification uh, with concerns to operational parameters, functions, safety aspects, um, that the supplier really knows what you really need. Um, because today also such battery or especially energy storage systems, they have to fulfill not only one simple application, um, they must actually operate uh, with, with multiple applications, starting from like control reserve, peak shaving, uh, grid support, reactive power support, whatever. And what we often see also that there are possible misunderstandings between the client which uh, buys the battery, the storage system, and the supplier, because also there is not yet a unique terminology. Um, it starts, for instance, if you know with the energy capacity term, you can have a net capacity, a cross capacity, total energy capacity, uh, depending what is the usable energy content and what is just kind of a reserve um, in, in the battery to not, yeah, to protect the battery system from overcharge. Uh, deep discharge. And so there is a, a standard, the international standard, the IC62933, which tries to harmonize the terminology and gives definitions and uh, provides also um, two parts. One part, actually, what you have to, um, yes, um, 
to concern during the planning process of your battery system. And it gives also um, a basic methodology uh, for acceptance testing. And recently, which is maybe also interesting, that uh, in Germany, from the Association of uh, Energy Storage Systems, uh, the PVS, a guideline for fire protection and risk assessment, which is quite comprehensive, was released. And so we as AIT do also acceptance testing in the field and in the laboratory. And uh, I want to give you just some experiences what what we see and um, yes from starting also the tests for Wiener Netze for their battery systems we also realized that it's quite uh, quite important to do this acceptance testing uh, first in a laboratory or also on-site testing if not possible in the laboratory um, to validate the data sheet um, with the real values because there's Sometimes it's it's not the same, but yeah, what what you have got promised and what you really receive. And um, regarding the performance and the functionality of the system, and this is especially for battery systems more the case because um, usually you have um, a manufacturer for the inverter, a manufacturer for the battery system, and both components have to interact with each other. So um, they have to communicate and sometimes it, it doesn't really work out also because there are new individual function, functions which the system has to supply like um, frequency, yeah, to support the frequency in the grid, uh, the voltage and so on. And at the same time to, to peak shaving whatever so the complexity is quite high if they have to if the systems yeah must fulfill um, different functions at the same time and this requires um, acceptance testing to find problems in quite an early phase um, of the project and to save overall costs um, data um, and what we also see that actually also further development of the standards and testing procedures require, there are some guidelines. Uh, there is this IC standard, um, but there's still a lack in, uh, let's say, step-by-step -step procedures um, as, as, let's say, um, yeah, for to be compliant with the grid connection rules. <clears throat> so, and from this, I want to go a little bit deeper, um, what we can test actually um, regarding the performance of such systems. Um, the first thing is, of course, the efficiency, the battery efficiency and the energy capacity. Um, and we do this by just um, applying multiple full discharge and discharge cycles um, with different power levels. And um, our experience from the yet from testing uh, of many different battery systems and different sizes is that lithium ion efficiency is, is uh, so the efficiency of lithium ion batteries can be quite high, uh, usually between 90 and up to 98%. So this is only on the DC side. Um, and there is also this figure on the right side, um, which is um, a study from uh, actually for residential storage systems uh, where a comparison is done. And you can see also that the efficiency was for all these systems quite high, over 90%. And the next test is um, actually yes, the inverter efficiency and the standby consumption. So um, when you have to connect the battery to your connection point at the grid, you need the inverter. and um, for this, um, you usually generate like this efficiency charts here uh, on the bottom right side, this figure. And here you can see like the efficiency for discharging on the right side, that the efficiency is quite high at nominal power, but the efficiency is lower when also the discharge power or the charging power is lower. So if you read in a data sheet, um, 
about efficiency, not only the peak efficiency, which can be up to 99% is important, but also this partial load efficiency here at low power and the standby consumption is important. And at the end, we can do also a ground trip system efficiency test, which actually combines both the both loss mechanism, inverter losses and um, battery losses. And here you really have to be aware that the efficiency of the total ground trip efficiency, so the losses for one charge discharge cycle, that the efficiency usually is not higher than around 94% for the inverter and battery system together. Um, because sometimes they see in the data sheet quite high values. And yes, I continue with this one. Uh, and the next test is to do the act to test the active and reactive power capability, um, which is uh, like here, this um, this graphic here, the circle is the apparent power limit of the inverter. And usually like TV inverters can only feed in active power here, but battery system have the big advantage that they can operate uh, yes, as in poor, as poor quadrant operation. So they can provide overexcited, underexcited reactive power to support the grid voltage. And they can discharge to the system, but also charge from the electricity grid, uh, for instance, to stabilize the frequency or voltage. And then I will um, hand over the presentation to my colleague Roland, which will give you uh, a little bit more details about the systems which were installed in the field. Hello, everybody. Um, sounds perfect, but it isn't. Um, on this slide, you can see the real range of the capability of the battery storage. And um, on the right-hand side, you see the temperature and um, the C-rate. The C-rate is the measurement of current in which a battery um, is charged and discharged at. For example, um, one C-rate um, means a fully charged battery with a capacity of, of um, perhaps or maybe 10 ampere hours should able to provide 10 ampere for an hour. So, um, but in, in, in the, on the side, um, the temperature and the SOC influences the capability, which means the battery systems provide the power just under perfect condition, which means 20 degrees. If you are leaving this, um, 20 degree window, um, the capability is shrinking. So you can um, live with the reduction of the of the C rate, or you can heat or cooling the systems, um, but then the efficiency drops. So um, the behavior of the SOC um, is the same um, as, as the temperature. So um, when the SOC um, shrinks, um, the cell voltage drops and the power is multiply voltage to ampere. So the capability is also shrinking. You so you can see um, if the SOC drops, um, the, the window of the, of the operation is shrinking. Next slide. Here you can see um, the BSS in operation and how it works. Um, on the horizontal, horizontal axis, you can see the time. And on the vertical axis, you can see on the right-hand side the SOC in magenta. And on the left-hand side, you see the power in kilowatts. Um, and when you look at the chart, you can see that um, the three phases, the active power, um, here on the chart, it's um, light blue, orange, and green. You can, um, they are asymmetrical because um, on one phase, there is just um, the tele are connected or the light. And on the other phases, there is a, a big oven. And so um, it's not always at the same load of the, of the phases. So we can do 
the, um, the symmetrical um, um, operation of the system and we can um, simultaneously um, do some um, uh, managing of the reactive power, which means that you can produce the reactive power locally um, so you don't need to transfer the reactive power over the medium voltage line um, to the substation, which means that you can increase the capacity of the medium voltage and you can supply more um, reactive power, uh, more, um, more active power to the, to the customers. Next slide. Um, yeah, that's the, the advantages of the BSS. You can increase the availability of the grid capacity. Um, you can um, quick and convenient implement it on site. If you like, or if it is necessary, you can um, re relocate the BSS on another um, substation. The BSS is a new active asset for the DSO. Um, you need um, security, you need no, um, IT know-how. Um, it's like an, an hybrid engineer, which means um, has to has to have skills in normal electricity and IT. So the the the, the, the companies needs employees with more know-how and skills. So it's also better for the companies. And um, the experience shows that the maximum power of the BSS can't be um, applied at all time. As you see um, some slides before, cause of the um, sinking SOT or the temperature, which is not always at 20 degrees. And um, the measurement shows um, also that there is no ideal configuration of the BSS, which means um, that um, not every substation is similar, similar to the other. So you need, at one stage, you need more, more power and um, on other stations, you need more um, energy. So it's very um, hard to find the, the ideal configuration of the systems. So thank you for your attention. That's from my side. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much for these interesting presentations. Um, <clears throat> I just have a look if we have some uh, questions from the chat. Could you give some indication about the costs of such BSS solutions? Um, from my side, I can say it's about 1,000 um, euros per kilowatt kilowatt hour roundabout okay mm, and what do you it think depends on scale yeah <laughs> uh, what do you think um you told about main challenges what would be what are the next main steps for the future research in this field to bring it in um in scale which, which means not um, that we are um, buying another um, 10 or 100 um, BSS. It's more than um, to get ICT in the substations. It's, it's bigger than just the storage itself. It's, um, it's accelerating the ICTs and the, the, the connection and the communication to the substations. So we can also use it for measuring the, the loads um, in the substations and not just for storage. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting concept. So um, I have to thank you now at this point. Um, and I have to thank all the speakers in session two. And now it's time to let you go into a one hour lunch break and we will meet again at 1.15 here in the same meeting. Thank you very much.
Hello and welcome back from the lunch, lunch session. Uh, my name is Bianca Pfefferer from the Austrian Society for Environment and Technology. And I'd like to welcome you back um, to our third session today, to the afternoon session. Um, I hope you made good use of your uh, lunch time and were able to refresh yourself a little. And now uh, we will go on with three more presentations with very interesting insights uh, on different technologies for storage technologies. And uh, yeah, we will conclude our afternoon with a very interesting panel discussion with uh, international speakers. So um, for our next presentation, I'd like to welcome two experts uh, on integrated multi-energy storages uh, from the Hydrogen Center Austria. Um, first, Ma Marie Gabrielle Macherhammer. She is responsible for the area electrochemical technologies, and she's working mainly on hydrogen, produc hydrogen production based uh, on renewable energy, for example, water electrolysis. And the second speaker is Wolfgang Siegel. He is a process engineer and PhD in material sciences and focusing on hydrogen and embrittlement. Uh, the both of them will present the role of hydrogen in our future energy system and the project Cross Charge Point, uh, which develops solutions for communities and other stakeholders to be able to align uh, supply and demand in electricity and hydrogen based energy systems. So please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Pfeffera, for the nice introduction and the very welcome from my side to this afternoon's session. As already mentioned, we are going to present um, the project Cross Charge Point, which will be explained in detail by my colleague. And I'll start off with a general introduction. Um, and I'd like to take the opportunity at the beginning to introduce the High Center Research Company. We are an extra university research organization, which is um, majorly owned by the Graz University of Technology. And as you can see, we are also at the campus of the Graz University of Technology. We are only con we are concerned only with the generation and usage as well as storage and distribution of green hydrogen. And the High Center has been introduced more than 16 years ago, which leads to many successfully finished projects and the possibility also to build up a quite modern testing infrastructure. This also includes um, two refueling stations for buses and trucks for hydrogen refueling stations. And right about now, we are about 50 researchers from different fields. We are now more than aware of the climate change which is introduced by the anthropogenic um, era. And uh, to overcome the problems and to start to build up some, some uh, technologies and solutions, the Austrian government has introduced two very ambitious goals. One would be the based on the mission 2030 to be 100 will produce 100% renewable electricity until 2030. And the second goal is to be climate neutral by 2040. And these very ambitious goals are based on the problem of global warming, which you can see here on the right hand side and picture based on the IPPC publications that we have to reduce global warming lower than 1.5 degrees Celsius to be able to, that there won't be any problems with um, disastrous environmental impacts by the temperature increase. On the left hand, you can see that there are several scenarios how we can reduce global warming is to need, we need to reduce a, um, reduction of greenhouse. We need to reduce uh, greenhouse gases. So there are three strategies for the implementation for doing so. One is the expansion of renewables and the integration of renewables through our energy storage system, which goes back and circles back to our first goal in Austria. 
The second strategy is to be more efficient, more efficient uh, concerning energy conversion. And the third is um, to reduce consumption in every case. How can we introduce more renewables into our energy storage system? And um, this is a slide which is quite similar to the one Stefan Bauer showed us in the morning session. And this is the production and demand of electricity in 2050 based on the publication of the Bundes Umwelt Bundesamt. On the y-axis, you can see the monthly energy production and demand in terawatt hours. And on the x-axis, you can see the generation or demand throughout the year. So if we look at photovoltaic electricity production in red, you can see already that there is in summer a lot more production than in the winter month. Um, for the wind power, it's quite um, ambivalent throughout the year, but then again for hydro hi, um, hydropower, it's all already you can see that there is a lot more produced of renewable and electricity in the summer months. So if you sum that up and compare it to the demand, the electricity demand throughout the year, it's obvious that there is a gap in the winter months, which we calculated here with about seven terawatt hours. But if you look into the summer month, you can see quite clearly that there is a nice excess. And this means, as already mentioned, we need to transfer this energy amount from summer into winter. For us at the high center, and I think as um, you heard some of the speakers, this is where we see hydrogen come in. And this is our vision of the hydrogen econ economy. So um, producing green electricity, as already mentioned before, is a perfect way now to um, store it in batteries, as we heard just in, 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 the, in the lecture before. But you can also use it directly with a battery electric vehicles or in industry or in households. But due to the fluctuation, we need green hydrogen to store it long term. And there you can either store it um, on the ground or in short term, gases storages, and you can also pump it into the gas grid and then either use it directly in industry, mobility or households or re-electrify it via fuel cells. And this is where I give over the presentation to my colleague who will talk about the cross charge point project. Thank you very much, Marie. I will take over here. I will present you one project we are working on at the High Center. It is called Cross Charge Point. The, the idea is to develop the so-called Cross Charge Point, which is a virtual power plant that has the, the goal to link energy generation, energy conversion, energy storage, and the mobility sector. The goal is to store surplus energy from the grid, either in long or, or short term storage devices or directly transfer it to the e-mobility by charging electric vehicles. The, um, the project is to get, it's an international Aeronet project together with several partners from from Germany, from Israel, and from Austria. You can see the partners on the bottom of the screen. It is funded by the FFG. And as it has different regions, which are looked at in Austria, in Germany, and in Israel, of course, there are different characteristics of those, those re regions, which are then um, simulated and modeled based on simulation processes. Um, the overall um, framework is will be a regional energy management system which controls and monitors the CCP infrastructure. Also, energy conversion, especially power to gas, is integrated into the system. If you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. There, there's a lot of information on this slide. I will shortly show this the scheme of the CCP project. On top, you see the, the input layer. You get different amount of data and different data. For example, weather or traffic data, 
which is then in a second step processed by the CCP. The CCP processes all this data in regard to forecasting. It looks um, where is demand for charging of vehicles, where is the, no, the, the capacity. And then in a third operational layer, focusing on three different sectors, this information is distributed either for optimizing the grid and the traffic for future grid expansion, for planning of the grid, for construction, for focusing on the business sector by the creation of value and finding the cost optimum operation. And third, the adequate um, operation of the CCP regarding the grid. For example, if there is a lot of surplus energy available, it will be used to convert to, to gas, for example. Or if a lot of, of cars are needed to be charged, then the electricity will be used to charge the cars and not to generate hydrogen. So next slide, please. And we here at, at High Center have developed in-house uh, modeling system, which is called Hydra. And with this, we will work on the CCP project. In Hydra, it works like, like fo as follows. First, you define the usable potentials, for example, which energy is available. In the next step, um, the local demands are specified. What is the demand for energy or for power or for heat? Then you can design the plant as you want. You can, for example, you can add electrolyzers, you can add hydrogen generation, you can add methane generation. All this works by a dra drag and drop system. You can define the operating, operating strategies. You can focus on cost-based operation or on demand-based. You can focus on the stabilization of the grid. And then in the last step, the technological and economic optimization takes place. And this is an iterative process. So it then goes back two steps and optimizes the plant. And with by means of this operate, um, iterative process, the ideal result is generated. At the end, you get the documentation of the whole process. In the next slide, I will shortly give an overview of the operating strategies that are available. I mentioned these before. You can focus on cost-based operating strategies to optimize the cost. You can look at the demand to, um, to uh, optimize for, for the, the hydrogen demand you have. In a, a second operating strategy focuses on grid stabilization, which is, as we know, a very big topic at the moment. And third, you have the forecast-based operating strategy. For example, if you want to have an electrolysis, electrolysis system, you can optimize it that it works when there is excess energy available and then produces hydrogen. And of course, all of these Operating strategies can also be combined. Yeah. For the, the key messages that we want to present at High Center, which are the key messages we believe that are important. Of course, for us, hydrogen is seen as a very important contribution and essential contribution to, to zero emission um, energy society in the future. We should invest now, begin investing now in hydrogen, um, hydrogen development of technologies as the early, earlier hydrogen production scales up, the earlier it will be available for all sectors, for in the industrial sectors, for private sectors. To, um, it's good to combine all activities which are done now in hydrogen research and also by, by combining energy communities by combining all the, the members of, 
energy systems, the, trans the transformation of the whole energy system can be faster. And last but not least, research and development has to be strengthened. And by that, we can generate new technologies and we can ensure smooth and fast market introduction of hydrogen technologies. Thank you very much. Um, it was a pleasure to present and we are of course available for questions. Thank you, thank you both. Um, I think we have already one question from the audience. Um, uh, is cross charge point also looking into bidirectional EV charging technology? No, it will. Um, bidirectional means that it will also treat the vehicles as um, as, high, as storage of energy, I suppose. No, it will only go in one direction, the charging. So it will only charge the cars, but the grid will not take energy of, out of the cars. Okay, thank you. Do you have any further questions? Um, so uh, I have a question uh, regarding the efficiency of the conversion process from from power to uh, from ele electricity to hydrogen and back to uh, electricity again. Can you tell us what the efficiency is currently? Yeah. Um, of course, the efficiency is not that high. We usually calculate for an efficiency of the electrolysis with around 60%. And then, of course, to convert it back to electricity, there are losses again. So this is, of course, only efficient um, if there is a lot of clean energy available. If there is a lack of energy, it does not make that much sense, for example, to generate um, chemical energy carriers out of electricity. Okay, thank you. But surplus energy surely can uh, can be converted to hydrogen and yes. the storage in this case makes yes. sense. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Do we have any further? No, then <laughs> thank you uh, for your insights in your um, in your technology and the uh, and, uh, uh, activities you're doing in the project. And yeah, we will move on to our third speaker this afternoon. Um, the next one is uh, speaking is Andreas Hauer. He is CEO of the Bavarian Center for Applied Energy Research and also manager of the IEA uh, Energy Storage Task 35. He has been focusing on energy storage technology de development over the last 30 years and as a vice president at the German Energy Storage Systems Association, he's also responsible for R&D act activities. Uh, Andreas Hauer will speak about the importance of sector coupling for integrating high shares of renewable energy in our energy system and uh, give an overview of the variety of possible storage solutions. Mr. Hauer, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can see my slides now. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, yeah, it's really a pity that I cannot be in Vienna now. Um, we just missed it. Um, I was in Vienna two weeks ago. That was great, meeting people. And we had a task meeting on this topic here. Wonderful weather and good exchange. And now, yeah, it's online again. Um, yes, I will talk about flexible sector coupling. Uh, let me start a little bit by um, the definition and the concept uh, of this expression. Um, I would like to, to begin with, the, um, with a, a picture of the CO2 emissions and uh, how they were caused by the different, uh, uh, let's say, statistical sectors. Here you have it on the right side, industry, private household, trade and commerce and transport. Um, and th these are data for, for Germany. And I would like to sort them in a different way, these uh, CO2 emissions, uh, following other uh, definitions of sectors. Uh, because in, in the sector coupling approach, you look rather at what we would call more demand sectors. So we have the electricity sector, the mobility sector, and the thermal sector. So um, after now uh, two and a half years of discussions uh, within our working group, 
this is more or less consensus. And the electricity sector, for example, is everything that deals with electricity, with electric energy. Uh, main put um, will come from renewable sources in the future. And it, it is everything that consumes electricity. Of course, it's lightning, ICT controlling, but it's also electric motors in industry or appliances in households, things like that. The mobility sector, um, kinetic energy, that's, that's pretty clear. It's transportation of goods and people. So everything, cars, trucks, trains, ships, planes, and so on. And then we have the thermal sector, the thermal energy, that's all uh, heating and cooling um, processes in buildings or industry. So it can be process heat, space heating, domestic hot water, and everything else. So now, if we now um, look at these um, CO2 emissions and uh, do, the, do the new structure, electricity, thermal, and mobility, uh, we can see that roughly one quarter uh, of the CO2 emissions is caused by the electricity sector. And more than half is coming from the thermal sector and about one quarter is coming from the mobility sector. And I think this is a very interesting result because that means um, that the thermal and the mobility sector are responsible for about 75% of the CO2 emissions, uh, let's say in developed countries. Um, so um, now I come to the, to the concept uh, of flexible sector coupling. The, the basis is that we believe in the future we will have the main input renewables coming from wind and PV into the electricity sector. So um, today uh, in Germany, we, ha we have a share of renewables in the electricity sector in the range of, let's say, 42, 45%. Um, but then we have the other two sectors, thermal and mobility. In the thermal sector, we have a share of renewables, let's say in the range of 12 to 15%, and mobility is in the range of 8%, something like that. So it, it, is, it is quite a good idea to couple the sectors and to transfer some of the renewable electricity into the thermal and the mobility sector. But if you do that, we believe it's a good idea to integrate some storage capacity because Without the storage capacity, we still have the mismatch in time of the supply of renewables and the demand. Uh, it's not always at the same time that we need the renewables when they are available, and therefore you need storage. Storage is the only technology which can close this gap. So that is the very basic concept. There are a lot of discussion on that, uh, and it, 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 that, that is pretty simple. And now the, the last way of visualizing this concept is a little bit more complex. Still, we have the three sectors, but we have now introduced a kind of intermediate level. That's a level which describes the energy carrier or the storage technology, the storage effect. Um, and all these carriers, they are really responsible for 100% supply uh, uh, to all to the three sectors. And then we can look at that like we have technologies uh, we heard from, from uh, Dan Bauer um, and the Carnot battery, for example. We heard also uh, in, in the last presentation, the expression vehicle to grid. Uh, we, we heard about uh, hydrogen and fuel cells. So these technologies all um, are kind of electricity storage and it's not sector coupling. We just touch the other, uh, let's say, um, is the storage or, or energy carriers, but we return to the electricity sector. Um, talking about um, sector coupling, we have to go really all the way from electricity, for example, to thermal. So that would be here using a thermal energy storage, uh, and it's a kind of power to heat uh, application, for example. And we can now look at different pathways from electricity to thermal. You can go over the gas or let's say the hydrogen path, more or less, power to gas solutions here for high temperature applications, for example. Or we go this way to the mobility sector and that's power to fuel, synthetic fuels, uh, let's say um, um, derived from hydrogen, from electrolyzers to the mobility sector. Or we can go from electricity um, uh, th through the uh, electrical storage batteries, for example, the way of e-mobility. And, and of course, we have something like uh, going to this way, electrical battery, and then going to the heating path. 
that's all possible. That would be a, a PV battery for, for heat supply, let's say, in single family houses, as an example. Uh, you see, this is the common understanding in our group, at least now for this flexible sector coupling concept. So now uh, I would like to uh, show you some example to make it clear what, what, we, what we believe in, um, what we call storage configurations. So this, just to remember the, the very simple uh, picture, um, and now we have these pathways from the source, which is mainly electricity, um, and, and now we go uh, into the storage uh, devices. It can be chemical, electrical, or thermal storage. So this is the hydrogen pathway. And then we have the other sectors, mobility and uh, the thermal one. And then we go, the next step would be real applications. Let's say here you can say for, for the transport sector can be light or heavy uh, cars or anything like that. Or here we can go into the industrial path or let's say the residential or building or built environment, however you want to call it. And, and these, this is the, the, these pathways are very important in our understanding of the examples for storage applications. So we collected quite a number, I think more, more than 30 at the moment, um, collecting and evaluate, uh, evaluated uh, the, the project examples we had. Uh, so we, we found a wide variety of storage technologies available. Many of them are already on the market um, and, and uh, quite a number is still um, subject to R&D activities. And we have this compilation of collected project examples and I will show you a few of them. Uh, for example, here we have battery storage for power to mobility application. So that's a, uh, an example from Germany. Uh, you have here this, uh, what just has been mentioned in the previous uh, presentation. We have this um, bi-directional use of the storage capacity inside an electric vehicle. Um, next example is um, a distributed cold storage within a, a district cooling net in, in Sweden, uh, where um, surplus electricity is used to produce cold and the cold is stored for, for cooling demand at a later point in time. Next example is uh, a heat and electricity storage for power to heat application. That's from Austria, from IA Intec. Um, so that's a kind of a hybrid system where we have two storage technologies and we provide uh, heating and electricity uh, in, inside a building. And you see th this can be very complex and on a small scale, you can really realize within a building um, all these uh, sector coupling pathways. Here we have now electricity and heat provided. Um, and the next step, that's an example from Germany, Living Lab Energy Campus in Jülich. Uh, and now we try to, they, they try to bring together all the technologies. Now, now we have uh, electrical, thermal, and chemical energy flows. So uh, let's say a complete supply of the energy demand by different storage technologies based on renewable electricity. So um, all this comes from an activity from the energy storage TCP. Uh, it's what we call task 35. Uh, it's called flexible sector coupling. So the main goal is to clarify the possibilities and the impact of energy storage implementation in this flexible sector coupling context. Um, so it's uh, about developing um, this concept all the time. We want to identify technologies suitable for this application, uh, talk about the non-technical barrier. So that's the regulatory framework. And uh, in the end, we would like to quantify the, the, the potential for storage here um, and uh, maybe have a, a comparison to no storage solutions um, and identify the most promising storage configuration. I already showed you some of them. And then we have this, this kind of subtask structure. So uh, after the first meetings, we decided that we will have a subtask one, which is called concept development, because we uh, realized that the discussion about this concept uh, will be a very long one, and it won't be uh, really finalized at the end of this working group. So this is why, where we try to um, write a white paper on the concept 
and it's kind of a living document. Um, and parallel, we have this uh, collection of configurations. So I showed you some of the results. We have many more of them. Um, and then we had two subtasks dealing with the modeling of this concept to find out what is really the impact of this approach uh, once on a local level and uh, in subtask four, finally, on, on a national scale, uh, really see uh, what can flexible sector coupling achieve in sense of integrating a high share of renewable uh, energy. So the scope of the task is that we look at all the storage technologies, uh, that we try to look at all applications in the heating and cooling sector from buildings to process heat. So from low temperatures to very high temperatures. Uh, and then we look uh, that we look at all the applications in the mobility sector and all uh, propulsion technologies. So quite open, but still very much focused on storage. So flexible sector coupling, but storage. Um, finally, my conclusions, um, the electricity sector will have the highest share of renewable energy input in the future. So that where renewables arrive, so to speak. Um, and then we have uh, the, this, what I showed you, that the thermal and the mobility sector are responsible for three quarters of the CO2 emissions. So that's very important. So electric, uh, only electric, uh, so decarbonizing the electricity sector is not enough. Um, and the this, this next one is sector coupling is crucial for decarbonizing all sectors and only flexible sector coupling allows to match supply and demand. Only uh, storage can uh, um, close the gap in, in supply and demand in time-wise. Yeah, and the final one is that we really have already now a number of energy storage technologies available to address this approach and hopefully more in the future. Yeah, thank you very much at that point for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hauer. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience yet? Um, maybe I can start with one. Um, how may you, you estimate the, the current capacity or feasibility for sector coupling, coupling of, um, of our actual uh, energy system, maybe in, in Germany or in Austria? Do you, can you estimate the, the capacity a little for us? No, I, I cannot. I'm, I'm sorry, but this is this is actually really uh, one of the results we, we're looking for. And at this meeting I mentioned uh, two weeks ago, I learned that uh, the results for the uh, national scale modeling will come in next spring. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to to what is possible with this. But we can see from from what I showed uh, that that the the problem is it's it's very um, difficult because we have so many uh, different technologies at hand. So we have very uh, a huge variety of solutions and they all are uh, necessary because they all cover a certain, uh, let's say, uh, field of applications. So let's say we're talking about cold storage or we're talking about uh, domestic hot water or we're talking about uh, trucks. Uh, so each of these applications uh, have a special, uh, uh, let's say, uh, energy sol storage solution. And, and that makes it quite complex and very difficult to, to go, go for one number. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, one question from the audience arrived is, um, can biogas play a role? Now I can't see the question anymore. Uh, so, sorry, yeah, it, 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 sorry. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I agree, of course. I, I neglected uh, a number of, let's say, renewable input um, other than PV and wind. Um, and that, that is, uh, I, I didn't forget it. I just want to show it that our approach is focusing on that one. And of course, and I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm growing up with uh, the idea of solar thermal energy, for example. So that is something which, was, which would go directly into the thermal sector. Uh, and, and biogas is, is, a, is a very nice solution because it can go into the thermal sector, it can go into, into the electricity, electricity sector. And of course we have water power and everything else. Um, but, but the focus on, in, in this approach is on the fluctuating input coming from wind and PV. Okay. Just neglecting the other ones. 
Thank you. So, so all the renewable energy carriers will play a role in the. Yes, of course, of course. Yeah. We, we're not saying, and and we have also uh, excluded some other very important aspects of, of sector coupling. So you can go into, let's say, power to product uh, or power yeah. to chemicals, and all these things are very, very interesting uh, solutions. But it, it's it's not the focus of our activity. Okay, yeah. thank you. So as we have no further questions. I like to thank you all, um, all our speakers from the afternoon session, um, for sharing their experience and their reso research results with us today. And now I like to hand over uh, to Sabine Mitte, which will uh, moderate the panel discussion. So, welcome back to our. Uh last session today. Uh, it's the panel discussion on the energy storage in the transformed energy system. Are there different paths? Uh, we have heard a lot today about uh, R&D projects, about innovations in all the lectures and discussions, uh, both in Austria and also on international level. Now in the uh, panel discussion, uh, we would like uh, to focus more again on the policy and implementation level and take a closer look at the importance of different energy storage technologies in decarbonisation strategies of three European countries, namely the United Kingdom, Denmark and Austria. Therefore, I would like to uh, welcome my four panellists, uh, which I would like to introduce now. Uh, it's Jacina Morris from the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy in the United Kingdom. Uh, Jacina is an Innovation Program Manager. She currently leads on the delivery of the Department's Longer Duration Energy Storage Demonstration Program, uh, which is part of the wider Net Zero Innovation Portfolio that provides funding for low carbon technologies and systems. Welcome, Jacina. Then uh, Per Alex Sørensen from Plan Energy Denmark. Uh, he was a co-founder of Plan Energy in 1983, uh, which is a non-profit foundation for energy efficiency and 100% renewable energy. He's working on strategic energy planning for cities and regions and flexible district energy systems and large-scale thermal storages. Welcome, Per Alex. Then uh, Christiane Brunner. Uh, Christiane worked at the European Centre Güssing. Uh, then uh, she was member of the Green Party in the Austrian Parliament for nine years. And since 2019, she's responsible for corporate affairs in Verbund, uh, where she's covering climate, environment and energy aspects. And Verbund is one of the biggest producers of electricity from hydropower in Europe. Welcome, Christiane. No. And last, Ernst Höckner from Wien Energy. He is expert in the Department of Research and Energy Technology of Wien Energy, Austria's largest energy provider. And he has professional expertise in district heating, thermal energy storages, hydrogen, and is also participating in, in various research projects. Welcome also. <coughs> Hello. Um, so, we will do... Um, some rounds. So in the first um, question, we want to take a closer look on the decarbonisation strategies of the countries uh, presented. Then we will focus a little bit more on the energy storage and deepen the first question. And in the third round, I can take some questions from the chat. So if uh, you already would like to put some questions during the first rounds, please do so. And then we will conclude the discussion uh, with final statements on actions needed. <coughs> so let's start with our international guests. And yes, decommunization strategies, that's the question. So um, please could you highlight some specific measures on which your country is focusing? Uh, Chachina, uh, COP26 has just taken place in Glasgow. So 
we were very aware of what's going on. But can you tell us a little bit more about UK's ambition to net zero? Yeah, so in the UK, we've published a number of different strategies over uh, a 12 to 18 month period. They, uh, firstly, we have the Prime Minister's plan for a green industrial revolution, and that um, kind of highlighted 10 key priorities across the whole system for decarbonisation. And we've built on that and published more recently our Smart Systems and Flexibility Plan 2021, um, which was published um, alongside our regulation partners, uh, Ofgem, who regulate our energy sector in the UK. And that sets out our priorities for decarbonising the energy system and was complemented by the Energy White Paper and also our hydrogen strategies and heat and building. So we take a kind of focus in each area and um, have published those strategies. Um, for me, if I think around specific measures, and I will focus slightly on the, the energy storage aspect of it, for me, there's kind of three key particular areas that we need to focus on. Uh, that's innovation. So that's the area in which I work in. I think there should be a, a particular focus on hydrogen, and that's been pulled out by the hydrogen strategy that has um, been published in the UK. And also for us, in terms of achieving energy storage technologies and helping to decarbonise, it's around markets as well. Um, so I think there's some key points for us to kind of pick up on uh, going forward. But uh, yeah, for me, uh, very much a focus on innovation on hydrogen and on markets, which we can delve in deeper. Great. What is uh, first insights? Um, per Alex, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the situation in Denmark? We've already heard very strong in, on the heating side, but maybe you can tell us more. Yeah, we have a, a climate law where decarbonization is uh, like all European countries, is 100% in 2050. But then we have uh, a goal of 70% in 2030. And just now we are fighting how to, to reach that goal. Uh, and the latest step has been that uh, the, the food production sector, the farming sector has, has been uh, actually all uh, Parties in the Danish parliament has agreed upon an agreement uh, with uh, reductions in, in the farming sector. And that's, of course, because the Paris Agreement includes food production. Uh, so, um, well, and then we are talking a lot about uh, uh, carbon capture and storage and utilization. So, um, but, but in my mind, our road uh, to 100% uh, decarbonization, uh, it started very early. Uh, and uh, if you look at the, the role of storages, uh, we made a calculation together with Alba University 15 years ago to find out uh, what happens when you cannot regulate your electricity production and you have to regulate the demand side instead. So if more and more fluctuating electricity is coming into your system, uh, how can you then regulate it in the most efficient way? And uh, it was in a way quite simple because the first step was to make combined heat and power plants uh, flexible. And to make them flexible, you need a, a, a thermal storage. So nearly all Danish uh, district heating utilities, they have a thermal storage for two, three days in the summer period and uh, six to 12 hours in the winter period. When even if, if you want to include uh, also excess heat from industries, you, you might to expand those storages to be seasonal. Uh, so so that's, you could say that's the first step. The next step is uh, is uh, power to heat by using heat pumps. And, and that's where we are coming now. Uh, so, uh, uh, we have introduced the first uh, 500 megawatt of heat from heat pumps, but it's, uh, it will grow uh, until, until uh, several thousand of megawatt coming from heat pumps. So, so that's, that's a step coming now, but it has to be flexible, so, uh, and it's not that flexible yet. Next step will be uh, flexible uh, 
uh, power to uh, to mobility, uh, and it's uh, it's just merging. And the last step will be power to X, power to uh, to electro fuels. So, uh, and and that's because the cheapest way is to use electricity when it's there. And you have to be careful not to use too expensive storage systems. So, so that has been our philosophy. Uh, I can see uh, there's a lot of discussion about hydrogen these days, and I think it's to start in the opposite end. Thank you very much. We've also heard in the last lecture all the options on the sector coupling side. So, very interesting. So. Let's come to Austria. Um, Christiane, in Austria we have a high ambitious goal, 2030, 100% renewable electricity generation, uh, climate neutrality already in 2040. How is uh, Verbund prepared for this challenge? How will you contribute? Yeah, thank you, Sabine. Thanks for the invitation. Have a nice afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, it was already told in the previous presentations that these are what you mentioned now are two main goals in Austria for fulfilling uh, the Paris Agreement, climate neutrality in 2050 and 100% renewables uh, in, of electricity demand in 2030, which means that we have to build capacities to produce 27 terawatt hours of electricity. Uh, and of course, for Bund as uh, an electric or the biggest electricity production company uh, in Austria is uh, prepared uh, to, uh, yeah, to to implement the the projects that are needed for for the implementation. We we support we support the goals, uh, and we are, are ready to take our, our share in in the implementation. Um, what we are discussing in Austria, uh, or what we've been discussing in, in the last month, which I think is also very important and also very important for our company is that we have a price on CO2, uh, not only for uh, the companies that are in the emission trading system, but for all sectors. This should be in place in the middle of next year in Austria. Uh, and um, we have, um, or soon there should be a law in place that regulates the funding of uh, green electricity. Uh, the next step, of course, has to be also energy efficiency and, and the heat sector. Uh, for us to be able to um, fulfill our, our task in, in the implementation, it is now very important that um, we also have, have the projects and, and the, the areas for the projects available. And I think in Austria here, it is very much important to have uh, a cooperation between all, all the bodies, between uh, the state and, and the federal counties, uh, so that uh, we will have uh, acceptance uh, of the projects that we need to build, uh, that the permission uh, runs smoothly, um, and yeah, that, uh, that that we not only have, have the funding, but also other framework uh, conditions to really be able to, to build uh, the projects that are needed. We also think that um, this, this has to be done, 2030 is, is not very far away, uh, we need to, to build the projects quickly, but when we also look at uh, climate neutrality 2040, we also have to think about um, long-term decisions, which mainly are focused on infrastructure, and for our company this uh, affects mainly the, the infrastructure for electricity, the grids, but also how we, when we will talk about storage later, how we will build up storage capacities. Uh, and here we are very interested and focus on, on the field of hydrogen. So how, what role will Austria have? Um, what do we need to have the hydrogen infrastructure in place in, in 2040? Thank you. Uh, now let's go to Ernst Höckner. Um, Wien Energy has also just presented its climate roadmap for a uh, decarbonized Vienna in 2040. Can you tell us a little bit more about the plans in the field of heating, electricity, cooling? Yes, indeed. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I cannot provide you the countryside of you. I try to provide you the uh, city side of you. Uh, as you know, Vienna wants to be climate neutral by 2040. And as you already mentioned, uh, recently we conducted a 
study together with an international international business consultancy that shows uh, what the path this for this ambitious goal could look like. And um, the main result is that the greatest leverage for uh, the decarbonization of our city is in fact uh, lies in the heating sector and the mobility sector. And uh, due to the decarbonization of these sectors, um, the electricity demand of Vienna will in increase uh, substantially over the next 20 years and even beyond. Um, with regards to the heating sector, as it is um, the biggest leverage, although the heat demand uh, is expected to decrease over the next couple of decades due to climate change and also uh, retrofitting efforts. Um, as you might know, Vienna has one of um, the largest district heating systems in Europe. And um, today, combined heat and power plants, CHPs, um, account for well, more than half of the heat production in our district heating system. Um, in the decarbonized scenarios for 2040, this uh, is not possible anymore, of course. Um, so uh, we hope that geothermal energy and large heat pumps will produce more than half of uh, the heat production that is needed for our district heating system. The share of thermal power, plant, um, power stations um, is will, will decrease substantially and will then be hopefully um, powered by green gas. The remaining part is mainly covered then by waste insulation plants and also waste heat from industry. Um, with regards to the mobility sector, another challenging sector to decarbonize, because if you want to decarbonize the whole city, we also have to decarbonize the mobility sector as well, which more or less means electrification. And uh, the ramp up of the e-mobility is for sure the strongest driver um, of future additional electricity demand. Um, the mobility demand in 2040 will probably be um, seven times as high as this today or even more, more than this. Um, with regards to electricity, electricity production, um, another important driver for the electricity demand is of course the cooling sector, which is expected to increase, also triggered by climate change, of course. In total, we expect the electricity demand of Vienna to increase by more than 60% till 2040. And at the same time, the electricity production within the city boundaries of Vienna will be reduced due to the elimination of thermal power plants and also because of limited renewable potential. Of course, there's still solar potential available and it is being addressed, but um, this, will, this potential will not be able to compensate for the power plants that are in use today. Um, of course, this transition comes with a pretty hefty price tag. Um, a rough estimation of um, the total costs of this transition to a renewable and decarbonized Vienna by 2040 is about 21 billion euros. And uh, the majority of this falls into the heating sector, including renovations. And of course, Wien Energy is uh, heavily investing in the decarbonization of the city, uh, also as a company. Uh, mainly in renewable energy production facilities. Um, of course, the, the transition of the Vienna district heating system, e-mobility, and also research and innovation. So we are pushing forward in this regard as well. Thank you very much for this uh, first round and overview on the net zero ambitions of countries and uh, city. So let's go to the second round and um, here, yeah, as I said, I would like to be more specific on the topic of today's conference. Uh, what role do energy storage technologies play in this uh, strategy? To which extent are they already been used and uh, what, what are the plans for the future? Let's start again with Georgina, please. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. So today there is around four gigawatts of electricity storage operational. Uh, I in can start Great Britain. if nobody else wants to. <laughs> Sorry. Um, in Great Britain, and uh, it's kind of made up of three gigawatts of uh, pumped hydro storage and one gigawatt of kind of newer lithium ion battery storage that has been built since 2017. 
Um, so I think in the UK, the need for electrical uh, electricity storage will rise as we see an increase um, in the vol like volume of variable, non-dispatchable renewables on the system. And I think there'll be an increase in peak demand through the electrification, electrification of heat and of transports, which we've heard from, from others. And uh, in the UK, it, it will be critical uh, to maintain energy security. Um, energy storage will, will be critical to that as we shift away from gas over the 2020s and 2030s. Um, in terms of the role that energy storage will play in the future, uh, storage over longer periods of time, so for example, across days, weeks and months, uh, that can help us to manage variation in generation and demand, you know, such as extended periods of low wind or cold weather events. And such technologies in the UK and I think internationally as well are typically larger in size and include things such as pumped hydro storage, compressed air, liquid air, flow batteries, gravitational and the conversion of power to hydrogen and then back to electricity. So I think by 2030 and beyond, we will need energy storage to be deploying in the most optimal locations and at all scales. Um, I think that storage will be providing significant flexibility to the system, potentially around 13 gigawatts in combination with flexible demand. And I think it will help address many of the challenges presented by a low carbon system, including you know, maintaining energy security, <laughs> shifting when generation is needed, alleviating constraints in the system, and also providing system stability services. So for me, it's very much about longer duration energy storage uh, in providing energy security and flexibility for the UK system. And as I've mentioned before, I think that whilst a number of different technologies will help to provide that, we also need to recognise that hydrogen has the ability to store energy you know, for longer periods of time and in large quantities. And as such, in the UK, uh, we think that hydrogen storage will play a key role in shifting towards a fully decarbonisation, uh, decarbonised energy system. And, and, and it has been recognised in the UK that hydrogen will be like crucial to us reaching our net zero carbon emissions by um, by 2050. So I think that hopefully gives you an overview of what we've got at the moment and the technologies and where we think that focus will go into you know the uh, 2020s and 2030s. It really gives a good overview. Uh, how about in Denmark, Per Alex? What's already in place and what's in, in plan? Yeah, uh, what's already in place is very much the thermal storages, but they are still under development. So uh, uh, we are going now from, you could say, those 200,000 cubic meters uh, WIM showed uh, earlier today. So I think the next step will be uh, 700,000 cubic meter water storage in the city of Odense. So uh, that technology will be developed. Uh, and also in Copenhagen, 70,000 cubic meters of water storage is now being built with uh, Austrian uh, membrane, polymer membrane. <laughs> so thanks by the, the GigaTest project. Uh, and that will actually be a, a huge buffer tank in the CHP system in Copenhagen and waste incineration system in Copenhagen to make flexibility. So, so we will need, of course, to, uh, to make the demand side flexible, we will need uh, the thermal storages, but, but now the electrical vehicles are coming in and uh, they, they have to be a flexible part also. Uh, and I think the next step will be power to X because we have several possibilities. We have a lot of biogas that can be converted to converted to uh, uh, to methanol, uh, and of course we have also good uh, wind possibilities to produce uh, hydro. Well, sorry, uh, uh, hydrogen. So, so we have a lot of possibilities, but but we are not 
having that much uh, need for electrical storages uh, when electricity is coming back as electricity. Because we have some neighbors in the Nordic countries with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, hydropower. So uh, for instance, Norway has a huge capacity of hydropower. So, so that's actually, uh, you could say, uh, flexibility. Uh, part also in a Danish system. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's a, that we have a lot of experience going on because we know that storage is very important. We have, for instance, one uh, system called underground pumped hydro storage, where you have a, a polymer membrane and you fill it with water, then you have 20 meters of soil upon and uh, there's a pressure, so uh, so you can use it as a pump tidal, but it's actually under uh, under 20 meters of soil instead. Uh, and also, we, we are trying with other uh, other systems, but still, we are we actually trying to find the cheapest way. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Christiane, how about um, in Austria? You already mentioned the 27 terawatts we have to build on renewables. Um, we heard this morning a lot about hydrogen and all different kinds of storages. Where is Verbund in all these uh, topics in, in, involved? Well, um Austria and Verbund as well, we have a high tradition in, in storage, in providing storage capacities, uh, especially also renewable storage capacities with uh, our, um, uh, hydropower or pumped hydropower uh, stations. Um, but still, uh, the Austrian power grid, uh, the grid provider in Austria, uh, tells us that we bring new more volatile components into the energy system, we will have uh, a seasonal uh, shift of 10 terawatt hours. So that's why, where we see our, how uh, big the future storage demand will be. Uh, and of course, um, Austria is kind of kind of lucky in that situation, having, as I said, the, the pumped storage hydropower plants. Um, but uh, as I said, that won't be enough. So Verbund is also focusing on the field of hydrogen. Uh, this is why uh, Verbund also bought uh, the, ga the gas infrastructure in Austria to have a look on that, how we can um, uh, build it up or refresh it into uh, also a hydrogen network in the future. Uh, we also are active in the field of batteries. We see batteries in a more, as, as possible storage in a more decentralized uh, area, also combined with uh, uh, electromobility. Uh, so uh, Verbund also provides um, charging infrastructure in, in Austria and combined with, with batteries, this, this can be a, a buffer in a more decentralized uh, energy system. So these are, these are um, technologies in, in the area of storage. But of course, in the electricity sector, we also thinking about uh, flexible products like uh, demand side response, things like that, to uh, have the, um, the consumers, whether it might be the industry or, or private persons, uh, as a small flexible part or as, as partner uh, in, in stabilizing the energy system. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ernst, how about in uh, Vienna? Can you tell us about some big storage projects or plans? Yeah, uh, again, I can try to bring the city's uh, point of view in this, in this regard. Um, as you know, uh, Vienna is uh, situated in a rather plain area uh, called... Now we can't hear him. Uh, oh, no, it's so uh, we don't have the possibility to. Uh, I have I have connection hiccups, so maybe some of those occurred. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, what I was saying is that uh, we are in, in a 
pretty plain area uh, uh, called Vienna Basin, and we don't do not have the possibilities to buy, to build uh, hydro storages, uh, pumped hydro storages. Um, and as in most bigger cities, um, with regards to uh, electric en energy storages that go beyond uh, battery electric storages, the options are pretty limited. Um, maybe in the future, hydrogen storages may play a certain role if the hydrogen revolution takes place, um, as many think it will. Uh, we will see. Uh, overall, um, cities will always be net energy consumers and uh, not net energy producers. And uh, the energy will have to be provided by the surrounding areas, in my opinion. Um, I personally think that the same is true for energy storages. Large cities uh, will contain uh, the biggest share of the population and um, their energy needs will be produced, stored and delivered to these consumer centers. Um, with regards to thermal energy storages, as uh, Pia Alex already mentioned, it's maybe a, little, a different story. Um, as you know, Vienna has one of the largest district heating systems uh, of Europe. And um, with the ongoing decommunization efforts, uh, we hope to establish and increase our geothermal production um, significantly. Um, as this thermal energy is harvested more or less all over the year, also in summer times, um, when the thermal demand is usually pretty low, there will be times when there is a thermal surplus. Um, and of course, the optimum solution would be uh, to store the thermal energy in seasonal heat storages. Um, in large cities like Vienna, the energy demand is pretty huge, and uh, so has to be have to be the energy storages in dimension, of course. Um, that's why we participate in research projects like uh, Alex already mentioned, GigaTES and also ATES, um, where we try to develop the technologies of large pit thermal energy storages and uh, other technologies like aquifer storages further. Because we think that uh, thermal energy storages are a key element of the decarbonization of the Viennese uh, district heating system. On a smaller scale, we already have and utilize uh, thermal energy storages like pressurized uh, tank storages that uh, mainly provide buffer and uh, flexibility for our district heating system and also uh, our gas fired CHPs. Furthermore, we also have uh, projects and research projects with lithium ion storages and um, also kinetic energy storages, uh, but they are more or less on a smaller scale up to now. Um, but we will, um, yeah, we will go on with this uh, also in the future. Yes, thank you very much. Um, we don't. <laughs> my colleagues are telling me we don't have any questions uh, from the from the chat. But maybe I can ask um, Ernst Höckner. Uh, you did not mention it in the first round, but. Uh, now in your last comment uh, about the um, thermal energy plants. Do they play a major role in this uh, plan for Vienna to feed it into the district heating net? Or Because at the beginning you mentioned mainly heat pumps and, and geothermal heat. Yeah, exactly. Um, in the future we expect that uh, the most, uh, that the largest part for for of, of our energy or thermal energy production in the future will be um, heat pumps and uh, geothermal plants. Um, we will also have thermal power plants uh, in the foreseeable future. We have them now and uh, we uh, plan to run them also uh, up into the next decade because um, they are necessary for, for our heat uh, production also in the foreseeable future. But um, on the long run, we hope to, to, to uh, substitute them um, with renewable sources, as already mentioned. But they will play a role in the foreseeable future as well. So we, don't, we, do, we will not be able to get rid of them um, that soon, if this answers the question. Um, sorry, the question was on a solar thermal, not a on solar, the, okay. yeah, solar. Ah, sorry. solar. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I only understood. Power plants. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Power plants. Um, well, 
um, with solar energy, uh, the problem is uh, that, um, well, the thermal energy is provided by the solar, solar power plants when um, they are usually uh, not needed. Um, because in winter times in, in Vienna, it's usually pretty foggy and the sun doesn't shine. So uh, uh, solar production is pretty low. But um, if the um, thermal energy storages that we discussed uh, uh, already, if they uh, play a, a certain role in the future, then of course there will be also be uh, there will be the possibility that they will charge uh, those uh, those um, storages as well. So of course there might be a, a playing field also for them, but um, up till then. We'll have to wait and see. So thank you very much for all these two rounds. But we don't have more questions from the chat. But so I would uh, suggest we go to the to the last round uh, of um, of statements. Um, here I would like to gain a little bit more feedback on what kind of action is needed in the field of research and innovation. Is there any uh, yeah specific uh, need? Um, what role, for example, for you does international cooperation play? Maybe again, Georgina, you would like to say something about it? Yeah, sure. So one of the key barriers to deploying, you know, large scale, longer duration storage is actually a, a financing challenge. And for us, that's because storage technologies at this scale have high upfront costs. They can take you know, longer to construct. And also what's key to this question is they carry risks associated with investing in you know, nascent novel technologies. And so I think that a key aspect of the financing challenge is that, you know, a lot of these large scale and longer duration storage technologies are novel and have not yet reached commercialization. They might not have been demonstrated at scale. Um, and there's an increasing that increases the technology risk um, of investing in these technologies. So in the UK to address this, We've launched a major competition this last year, um, which is worth up to £68 million of capital funding. And that competition's goal is to accelerate the commercialization of first of a kind, longer duration energy storage technologies. This competition, it encompasses um, electrical, thermal, and power to x energy storage technologies um, across a range of technology readiness levels so some of the competition will fund uh, technologies you know at the first demonstration stage around technology readiness level four and five and then we'll also do a, a, we're doing a grant competition that requires private investment as well for those technologies that are you know just pre-commercialization so to me there's um a big question around innovation around um demonstrating these technologies at scale in a commercial um environment and so that's kind of key i think to the adoption of new technologies which is key in the uk where we we don't have um a wider range like a wide range of opportunities for more pumped hydro um, so it's really interesting looking at what other technologies we can utilize geographic locations such as salt caverns and so on and so forth other technologies gravitational storage um, and from an international perspective i think those barriers exist in in many countries i think the the the, the nature the nascent nature of their technology that's international too and so the UK is currently working within the IEA TCP 
to support the introduction of a new task on medium duration energy storage systems, which will focus on around four to 200 hours um, of energy storage. So we're just starting to define that task and um, taking it to the EXCO meeting, um, which will follow this conference in the next two days. And that will aim to define what we mean by longer duration energy storage, what market mechanisms we need, the technologies that can provide those services. So yeah, very much a focus from me there on commercialization and which technologies do we know about today and how do we get them onto the system? Uh, we have now got also a question from the chat. Um, how can private customers be stimulated to provide local storage? A question to Verbund or to uh, City of Vienna. Well, I, I think there's um, this for for local customers, but but for for every player, uh, and I agree with Georgina that um, besides for research in in different um, storage technologies, we need uh, market signals to uh, implement uh, um, those technologies. And right now, the market does not give give the signal. Uh, for for storage uh, for various storage technologies, so there are to be uh, different different framework uh, conditions so that all uh, storage technologies have the possibilities to to come to come into the market. Also for for um, consumers. Okay. Um... The other question, how will geothermal heat on a large scale and consequent scale impact climate change? Um, I don't know who... Geothermal energy? Yeah. Well, it's, in fact, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty uh, straightforward. Um, geothermal energy uh, is... is ex Extracted more or less from from uh, from from the earth, um, which comes then free of cost up to to the surface. Uh, of course, you have uh, electric energy that you need for for the pumps, but this is um, not that big of a deal. And uh, this geothermal energy is more or less um, uh, CO two free. So uh, you can and and it's it's producing all over the year, so twenty four seven, and uh, can be uh, of course it's, it's a, dif a different water um, water cycle, but um, through heat exchangers you can then provide the heat into the district heating system twenty four seven, which then uh, provides uh, CO two neutral heat to the district heating system and then can replace, uh, for example, thermal energy plants, which are currently uh, mainly powered by gas. And this gas is then substituted. And uh, by doing so, it, uh, yeah, it contributes to, to uh, clean, uh, to, to the energy transition as a whole. So it's a pretty straight, straightforward process. Be business model for, for fossil companies for the future, so I suppose. Similar course, technology, pumping the hot water instead of the oil. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> you, you need you need the the geology, uh, the, the right uh, geological conditions for it. You just can't do it everywhere. Um, you you have some some things to check in beforehand, and it's it's not that simple because of course it's expensive and it's risky. It's a risky investment. But if it uh, if it it goes well, then yeah, of course it, it makes sense to do so, and uh, it's a, a major step towards a greener and more climate friendly uh, district heating system. Okay, there is a last question. Do you know of storage solutions or examples on the community energy scale? Yes, we have a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we have it in the district heating system, uh, in, in all our district heating systems. And I think uh, that's, uh, well, thermal storages are not so sexy, but it's very, 
uh, it's very necessary because if you look at how much heat we are wasting in Europe, in some areas we are wasting more heat than we use for heating up our buildings. So if we can utilize that, uh, and that that's uh, only possible with thermal storages, uh, then I think uh, could, it will be much more efficient. Uh, so we need to cooperate on that, and we need also to uh, cooperate in optimizing the, the, the systems, because uh, there's a lot of sub-optimization going on. So I think we have to learn from each other there. Uh, and one of the last things I have seen in Denmark is as plans for 4,000 megawatts hydrogen production, and uh, and there will be excess heat from that. So we have to to find out how to uh, utilize that in an in a efficient way. So system uh, calculations and cooperation all over Europe, we have to stick together. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, anyone who wants to give a, a final outlook on the need for action? I would just like to support uh, the point of cooperation. I think internet, well, because it was your question also before, international cooperation uh, is totally important because we have to, to learn from each other and also provide solutions to other parts of the world maybe. Uh, but not only international cooperation, I think cooperation uh, within the economy, cross-sector cooperation uh, will be, also when I look at, at the storage aspect will be crucial, like, for example, cooperating with the industry to um, uh, adjust uh, uh, demands uh, and, and find find new solutions. I think that will be a key in, in the future. I fully agree with you. Anyone else? Otherwise, I think... It was mentioned already so often today, the need for action, the need for research and innovation and for deployment. And yes, for that, I would like to, to thank you for the, for the discussion. Uh, I think it's time to, to close our conference. It has been a long day for virtual meeting. I hope you enjoyed the day and could gain a lot of information on innovative energy storage innovations. Uh, I hope it has also been a good kickoff for the tomorrow's EXCO meeting of the Energy Storage TCP. And yes, with that I would like uh, to thank uh, the organizing team here from ÖGUT and also Christian Fink from iInTech who is our EXCO in the TCP. Also, thank you very much for the technical team who provided us a perfect support today here. And yeah, last but not least, uh, thank you to all the speakers, the panelists, and all the participants for the attention and the fruitful uh, contributions. Uh, I said in the morning there will be a conference report soon available on our website and will also be provided uh, per email to all participants. Uh, thank you very much and have a nice rest of the day. Goodbye.